Centuries ago, the Malian emperor Mansa Musa sent his best and brightest scholars, explorers, warriors, and artisans across the great western ocean to discover new lands. They were never heard from again. Until now. Join creative director Tanya DePass as Invicta, the High and Old Blade Keeper, DJ Knight as Ikemba, the Musalian Bio-Priest, Michael Sinclair II as Eli, the Misajai Lightbringer, Christina Ariel as Sila 919, the Monsagene Bio-Priest, and Eugenio Vargas as the Storyteller, as they travel the stars, defend their homes, and treat everyone they meet luxuriously. Welcome to the Motherlands. everybody and welcome to session nope yes session four right what episode are we on episode four of into the motherlands we are so happy to be back with you all this week my name is eugenio i am the storyteller for this journey into the motherlands uh and i'm so excited that you all are here let's go ahead and go around right off the bat uh and introduce these other fantastic humans who are going to be playing with us this evening uh why don't we start eh, let's go in the other order this time so uh why don't we start with dj this week how you doing this week dj Oh man, I was not expecting to be up first. Hi, I'm DJ. <laughs> I totally surprised you. Sorry. You did. That was very smooth. Well played. I'm DJ Knight. I'm a uh, full time space and sci fi streamer here on Twitch. I have loved tabletop RPGs uh, for years and years. Uh, my first time playing one was a two year long like Pathfinder campaign where I was a, an, an, a half elf rogue. And being a bio priest is much different from that, but uh, I'm having a blast. <laughs> Uh, with these amazing people that are uh, part of Into the Motherlands. And not only these amazing people that are in the front facing, uh, but also the um, ridiculous amount of people that are in the back end uh, helping to make all of this run smoothly, as well as our host. We really appreciate you all, and thank you all for being here. Yeah, thanks. Also, love a rogue. Good choice. Solid choice. Appreciate all right, you. Let's, I like sneaking let's... up on people. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move around. Michael. Good evening, Michael. Ah, hey, uh, good evening. So uh, yeah, Michael Sinclair is second here. I go by Michael Crits everywhere. I uh, play a lot of TTRPGs on different things. And I also stream my own channel, not happening lately because I've been studying a lot. So uh, just check out my stream for intermittent times I'm streaming, Magic the Gathering, World of Warcraft, and Baldur's Gate 3. But yeah, that's that's me. Fantastic. Great games, great choices. Christina, hi there. Hello, can you hear me? You all good? My name is Christina Ariel at Christina Ariel, K-R-Y-S-T-I-N-A-A-R-I-E-L-L-E. I'm super excited to be here. Captain Sala 919 is life and you should breathe her in. Ooh, yes, I love that. All right. And Tanya, last but most certainly not least, our host here on this channel. How you doing? You are muted though. <laughs> We got through the others. It had to be you. Thanks. Hi. How are you? You know, hanging uh, in. About the same. About the same. It's been yeah, a, yeah. a clearly a day of technology is not on my side. So oh, hi. Oh no. I'm your creator, creative director, and I play Invicta, the high and all blade keeper, who is uh who is the only one willing to give our elephantine friend a hug. That's right. Oh, Bertrand and Rude. hugs. I love it. Yes. You've known me for years. You should not be surprised. Hugs are a luxury. But we did shall... Akamba not tell us to be luxurious with each other? There Appreciate you that. Hell uh, I was going to say it, exactly My grandma that. said. <laughs> I love you, Christina. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, no, my camera's going nuts. All right, there we go. Uh, so uh, that is our crew for this evening. We have some thanks, as we often do at the top of our sessions. First of all, a new thank you. Thank you so much to Urban Bohemian, to our friend Brian for that phenomenal rendition of our new opening announcement. Uh, something a little fun that we've tossed in this week. And I'm so very, very grateful uh, to him for recording that for us. Fantastic job. So thank you. I hope you all enjoyed that. We'll get to hear that uh, every week moving forward. Uh, and then of course, we want to thank some of our sponsors and supporters like we always do. We got to thank 
Die Hard Dice uh, for supporting our endeavors here in the motherlands. Uh, we will let you know about those Musalian Skies as soon as we can, but I know that some, uh, actually I think most of the cast, uh, has received some lovely sets from Die Hard Dice that we have uh, shared out over the interwebs lately. Some of them are reaching for them. There they are. <laughs> Beautiful colors, love it. Metallic, plastic, alt resin, all the things. Uh, so thank you so much to Die Hard Dice for your support. Uh, as we uh, anxiously anticipate the release of the Musalian Skies set, you can check out everything else that they have available uh, on their website, dieharddice.com. Next up, we want to thank Blue Microphones for making sure that we sound good for y'all every week. Uh, they have provided us with these amazing quality microphones, uh, XLR, USB connection, anything you could need for lots of different price points. Ooh, there's some more dice, yes. Uh, we super appreciate their support and uh, you can check out everything that they have to offer from Blue Microphones at their website, bluemic.com. Uh, Next up, we want to thank all of the folks over at Cortex by Fandom. Obviously, we could not do what we do here uh, without the Cortex system, which was released this past week. So all of you can get your hands on the Cortex handbook now. Uh, it is available for purchase. You can see the bits and pieces of that book that we have used and all of the other stuff that we haven't yet uh, or chose not to integrate because Cortex is a incredibly modular and customizable system. Uh, we are super excited to be partnered with them and to have all of their support, both technical uh, and otherwise. And finally, we want to thank Twitch for being a major supporter of Into the Motherlands for making this whole thing possible. We really are grateful uh, that Twitch is giving this uh, group of Black and POC creators not only the chance to create something for you all, but also to share our creation journey as we go. So thank you very much. And I probably don't need to tell you how to find the Twitch website because, well, you're, you're here. here. <laughs> and you have your family, you know. right? Yes. Um, sliding in literally at the last second, um, confirming that we we are going to do a mic giveaway. Um, our oh. our mod extraordinaire Warren is going to take care of that. So um, it's going to start sometime in the first hour. You must be present, and we'll pull in the last thirty to forty minutes of the show. Winner gets a choice of Yeti Nano or Yeti X, and it is worldwide. It is not restricted to any to the U.S. Fantastic. So y'all can get your hands on one of these lovely mics like we have here. Uh, and like she said, keep an eye on the chat and you do have to be present at the end of tonight's uh, session when, when the mods draw the name, uh, but you can be anywhere in the world. Excellent. Thank you for the update. Uh, no can't wait to see who, who gets their hands on that nice piece of hardware. Okay. I think that's all of our thanks and all of our bookkeeping here at the top. Would anyone like to kick off a recap of last week's session? Oh, Miss Silent 919 would like to. Yes, by all means. Oh, before I kick into the recap. Oh, that's not what you're raising your hand for. <laughs> no, I want to say shout out to our mic sponsor because I am blue. Dabby D, Dabby Da. Blue Dabby D, Dabby Da, Dabby D, Dabby Da. But last week we had solar flares and it was crazy. And we were just in this whole, like, well, it was just a wild situation. And it was super intense. And we were all just like, oh. and Silent was like, and then Isla was like, <laughs> and everybody came together and we worked out for the good and we made our way through the whole situation and Sala plugged her hair into a whole nother area and was working that area too. And then we all were just on the thing and then we're just like, <laughs> and like, it was intense. So uh, excellent. Thank you for the recap. I don't know what more detail we could possibly need. Uh, also, I have to tell you, though, I didn't realize that you had just seamlessly transitioned into your recap, and you started talking about solar flares, and I thought you were still talking about microphones, and like we were having issues, and I was like, man, I don't remember any of that, but I guess sometimes my adrenaline's going, and I, you know, things get blacked out, and I was like, oh, she's, no, 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 she's doing the recap. I love it. Great. <laughs> uh, do we, would anyone else like to, uh, contribute your character's point of view to that just truly flawless uh, and, and heavily detailed recap that uh, our Captain Sila 919 just gave us. Um, Invicta, you know, she, she tried to check in on Akemba and remind him that he can also treat himself luxuriously. And uh, she's having a a conflict of conscience and how to deal with all of this. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, Ikemba, Ikemba got a, quite the bump to the head 
uh, from a from a stray missile fire, uh, and both you and Victa and Eli uh, were concerned about his well being. Uh, anything to add, Eli? Or I mean, I think that covers most of it. But anything to add, Eli or Ikemba? Yeah. Uh, so also, it seems that most people have summed it up. Uh, there was uh, big hugs to uh, Bertrand towards the end there, and. Uh, and uh, Bertrand also warned us about the water container uh, that it sustained a little damage from these solar storms. So I think that from my note taking, that seems to wrap up everything. I think that covers it. Anything you want to add? Can Silas you shut down to... at the end of the conversation because oh, yes. <laughs> conversation is also a luxury. <laughs> wow. Too many of the feelings. Wow. I love it. Uh, anything we're missing from your point of view, Akemba? Nah, seems good. Yeah, it's a pretty good recap. We got there. We got there. All right. Well, as we said, uh, we are through the static, through the solar storms. Uh, there is, there was an alarm going off that Bertrand noticed that uh, indicated that there was some damage on the, uh, in the water tanks at the back of the ship. And uh, so that is sort of the immediate thing that Bertrand would like for you all to deal with. But I guess my first question uh, is, uh, Miss Sila919, uh, you have powered down, yeah, uh, to uh, both uh, end the conversation, but also you wanted to, to sort of recharge and collect yourself. Uh, do you think that you are going to uh, be back from that power down soon enough to head to the water tanks? Or are you going to let the rest of the crew handle that while you handle your own stuff? Recharging. Love that answer. All right. So, uh, as we see, uh, is anyone else not going to go with Bertrand uh, to check out the water tanks to see how bad the damage is back there? Does anyone want to do anything else? If uh, no yeah. one is going, uh, Eli will go and check, uh, go with Bertrand and go check out the damage that he is speaking into. I was also okay. planning to go. Okay. I was going to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, Bertrand is very thrilled with you all getting the ship through the static in one piece. Well, uh, still mostly one piece. Uh, so he's happy to have all three of you go if if you would like. That's too many people for Eli now. They are going to stay back and keep an eye out on Silent 919. They know that it's all Silent 919 has it. But at the same time, they also want like, there's people going to other sides of the ship. We just got a solar storm. So I want to make sure that if something happens. There's at least two people here to uh, figure out something if something goes wrong so yeah. absolutely absolutely and Bertrand you know appreciates that he'll he'll be in contact with you in communication with you if there's any need uh because he uh doesn't want to uh, uh bother uh, Captain Sila 919 while she um <clears throat> does uh, whatever it is <clears throat> that she is uh doing uh, and so he leads uh, Invicta and Ikemba to the back of the ship, uh, sort of near uh, the engine room that he spent most of that flight in. Uh, the storage, the uh, the storage tanks, the water tanks, and cargo hold are back in that area of the ship as well. Eli, you uh, you I don't know. Uh, do you sit at your nav station, or are you sort of being a little more chill about it and sort of keeping Sila nine one nine within eyesight, but sort of wandering around? You tell me what's what's Eli doing while he waits and watches. Well, they wait and watch. So sorry. Um, no worries. Thank you. Um, they are. We're. We're gonna. I'm gonna. Um, probably get in my my hammock and like kind of keep an eye out on Silent Nine One Nine. Like also look towards the uh, the debris shield and just look at what where we're going as well. Um, kind of co-piloting in a weird way because they know that yeah. uh, Silent 919 is powered down, but they also know that they can probably contribute by keeping another uh, set of eyes out. And kind of, they see like a star or anything, they'll probably meditate on the thought of like being a light bringer and seeing the stars around them. Yeah, and you can feel, I mean, not only do, do you see the stars, but you do feel them, even if they're far away. If there's enough, uh, if there's enough light coming to you from them, even if it's light years away, uh, you know, you do, your light bringer uh, training allows you to sort of feel that push and pull and flow of, of energy. Uh, and so as Eli uh, co-pilots, they keep their eyes out, uh, observing, recording, notating. Uh, we see Captain Sila 919 plugged in, powered down, uh, and 
powered down to all of us who are watching from the outside. Uh, but Sila919, uh, I don't think your internal processes are completely powered down. What are you, I don't know if it's dreaming about or thinking about or processing through, but what's going on in Sila's mind uh, as she is powered down now? What's she remembering? What's she thinking about? As Sila is taking in all of the events of the last adventure, the solar flares trying to maintain control of the ship, she is reminiscing about what led her to this point. And she is going back to a time when her emotion processors were being rebooted prior to Torch asking her if she would be up for the mission that she may not have ever done before, but was training and preparing to do in all of the window before this adventure. Yeah, absolutely. So as she sits there uh, processing and powering, uh, the memory sort of, uh, since, since her external processes are powered down, the memory sort of uh, becomes fuller and more vivid. And we're going to, we're going to take a few minutes here to journey with Sila on this memory uh, of what was going on that brought her here to this ship and this mission. So we find uh, Sila 919 in her memories and we find her as she is walking out of, uh, of a building that is full of other manzagene. This is a, uh, is a, a place where uh, various upgrades we could say, although we know how the manzagene as, as a whole sort of generally feel about physical changes, but it's a place where software uh, can be updated, uh, where any sort of uh, severe physical uh, injuries or destruction or whatever can be dealt with. Uh, it, is, it is sort of, I guess, in some ways, uh, akin to a manzagene version of a hospital uh, in some ways, but also like an auto sh shop, but I don't want to compare people to cars. You all know what I'm trying to say. Uh, Sila919, you are leaving this building. Tell us a little bit more about what you just did inside. At certain times, the Monsagana need upgrades. And Captain Sila919, previously Sila919, required some emotional updates to her system because there are some things that are not translating such as empathy and compassion. So she was trying to have those systems rebooted and logged into the system before she head off with Torch. And how is she, we'll talk about what the text said in just a second, but how, how are you feeling now that you've had that process done, that you've had those emotional uh, circuits and programming sort of rebooted and updated a bit? How are you feeling? Do you feel very different than you did before? Now that Sila has the ability to process what those upgrades were, she is wondering what is the point? And and that's sort of what the text told you as well. They did some upgrades and some updates and they you know, made sure everything was sort of where it was meant to be in terms of your processing and your programming. Uh, they did mention that, that they didn't notice anything particularly uh, out, of, out of whack. Uh, there were some, you know, like I said, some processes that needed updating, uh, but nothing seemed to be terribly, terribly wrong. So they, they let you know that if you continue to uh, experience problems with your emotional processes, please return at any time. One must wonder what is the point? Well, uh, the point of course is to be able to enjoy and experience the full spectrum of emotions, of feelings, that which our counterparts in the other cultures feel on a daily basis. Our experience here is both different and the same as theirs, and our emotional circuits assist in that experience. But why the oil? Ah, 
this is a uh, peculiar habit of some of our cousin cultures, uh, that strong emotion often brings about a expulsion of bodily fluids and liquids. This was the closest we could get for Manzagene. One must wonder why they do not use words and instead use these feelings. The, uh, the text sort of uh, pauses for a moment and, and thinks about it and finally says, I have never considered the true function of feelings beyond the aesthetic. Uh, I do enjoy beautiful things and they seem more beautiful with feelings, but on a purely objective and logical level, I shall have to compute on it. I am preparing for transition to a proper mission, correct? As far as we have been notified, yes. So would it not be for the best for me to be able to communicate with my words instead of with peers? Yes and no. Uh, from my experience interacting with uh, uh, cultures with innate emotions, uh, they can impressively read much from body language and the experience of emotions in others. You can communicate much with a tear. I believe that my understanding is that as a Monsagene, I am to be top tier, not shed tears. Can you explain why this is necessary? You say that uh, it conveys an emotion. As I understand, the emotions are sadness and fear and joy. And I don't see how any of these serve a purpose of being the best. And the text sort of pauses again uh, and after a moment says, well, I suppose it all depends on what you decide best is for you, doesn't it? It is going to be my position to lead. It will be my job to be of the utmost emotional intelligence. He starts so, nodding and says, yes. How is it more intelligent to cry than to truly feel and solve? This will likely sound strange, Sila 919, but in my experience, understanding something through study and data uploads is very different from understanding something based on your personal experience. If you are to lead and lead others, both of Manzagene and non-Manzagene origins, it likely will be important for you to understand and have experienced the emotions that they will undoubtedly exhibit during their missions with you. At this point, uh, while you're sort of thinking and feeling the tears and having this conversation, Sila 919, uh, your, your mentor uh, who, who has been sort of interacting with you and, and training with you and going through things with you, uh, who uh, is, arrives to sort of collect you, to pick you up uh, from, this, from this upgrade. Uh, and why don't you, do you, wanna, do you wanna tell us a little bit about uh, your mentor? As a Monsagene and 
an android. I do not remember my my origin. I just remember one day waking up and being silent 919. I don't have what the humans refer to as parents, but I have guidance and Mabel, my mentor, has been there since the beginning. And I do not understand why she sends me out to do these tasks that require emotions and feelings when actions are right there. Uh, and that is likely why she encouraged you to uh, to have this upgrade. Uh, so she arrives and she sees you with the with the tears and the clearly uh, engaged but somewhat flustered and maybe a little sort of uh, off balance tech. Uh, you two having this conversation uh, and she laughs. She lets out sort of this this joyful laugh uh, and says. <laughs> My apologies, is she, and she gestures at you, Silas, she's speaking to the text, she says, is she questioning the necessity of emotions? And the tech just nods and says, a fascinating conversation we are having. Would you care to join us? I have time before my next upgrade. Uh, and she, your mentor turns to you, Silent 919, and just sort of looks at you uh, with a, she has, uh, she, the face that she wears today, because she does uh, quite frequently change her face, uh, the face that she is wearing today is that of an older Manzagene woman, uh, and uh, beautiful sort of dark skin with just, uh, with crow's feet and, and some laugh lines, uh, and it is just a warm face, and she turns it to you, uh, Silent 919, and sort of quirks, quirks an eyebrow as if to say, you know, do you want to continue this conversation? If you were to upgrade my systems and expect me to go into a world that is run by such weak people that their emotions lead all things, I would expect that you would tell me why this is necessary. Do you expect me to go and to leak oil and get my way? Or do you expect me to make valid points? Your uh, mentor smiles uh, as this is likely a conversation that you have had some version of several times at this point. And she says, you well know, Sila 919, that I expect you such a capable individual to do both. I don't, I don't like, why, why do you program these oil so? I don't, I don't, it's, why is it so much to come now? Why? Is there so much, why does it feel as if my circuits are overloading? Why does she it feel as if there's nothing I can do? She comes <laughs> up to you and she takes her hands and she says, Sila 919, look at me. Take a deep breath. You have seen others do this. We need it not, but we can aspirate. Try it with me. It seems strange. She's just looking directly into your eyes. And after a few breaths, she turns to the tech and, and thanks him uh, and says to you, come. It is too much sometimes, but I think, I think you might enjoy this. And she leads you out of the building and, uh, and begins walking you uh, to a to a point in uh, in the city that you have not been, and we should talk about uh, where you are. So you are in uh, a region of Musalia. I'm gonna make sure I get this all right. Uh, you are in a a region of Musalia 
known as Nua Nual. Uh, it was, it is sort of the original place that the Musalians uh, began to build their civilization here on the planet after they arrived. Uh, it is a very fertile area, grasslands, green, excellent soil. Uh, there are, you know, some, some topographical features that can help with uh, defense and, and plenty of space. And the, the Hyanols, uh, who first met the original Musalians when they arrived, uh, picked out this spot for them because it was already very open. It was not inhabited by a ton of wildlife that would have been displaced. Uh, and, and it was close enough uh, to some Hyanol outposts that they would be able to come and go and assist uh, the Musalians as they set up their very first, uh, their very first sort of settlement. Uh, in that, it is also the home of many, many Manzagene. Uh, the the uh, sort of Manzagene uh, center uh, is here. Uh, it's where on those rare occasions that a new Manzagene is created. Uh, it happens usually somewhere here in Nua Nual. Um, there are a few places around that have the capability, uh, but that creation process is very carefully monitored uh, and so it isn't sort of just done willy-nilly um and so your mentor takes you uh out and you leave the the sort of city limits it's a busily busy bustling city you leave sort of uh the area around this this manzagene uh tech support building, whatever it is. Uh, you pass by all sorts of Musalians and Monsagene and Hyanol and Salansi and Misajai, all, all types in and around this city. You leave the city limits with her and any time that you try to question, if you, if you were to try to question her or ask where you're going or why, she simply tells you to wait and watch. Uh, and eventually you find yourself in an enormous sort of open field. There's a light breeze tall grasses, this, it's a beautiful day. The sky is, is perfectly clear and you can see the sun shining down brightly. Uh, and once you're there, she sort of lets go of your hand and she says, how are you feeling? I think it's referred to as overwhelmed. She nods and says, one of the less pleasant ones, I will admit. Why don't I... we... Oh, please. The beauty of this place is something that I've never processed before. And there's a calm in the beauty that takes away the Pain. She nods and says, good, good. Can you isolate as much as you are able that experience of beauty? The shape and the textures and the way that they come together is flawless in a way that it's more natural than these feelings. Excellent, excellent. Now, continue to focus on that natural flawlessness and tell me, Sila 919, why do you resist the emotions upgrades? I do not understand why anyone would choose to feel so much. And yet, if they didn't, would they have the experience you are having of this natural beauty? A true appreciation of something that even we Manzagene cannot quite capture in our creations. But with that beauty, there's a pain that is not it cannot be necessary, it cannot be necessary to feel so much pain. It can't, the, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. And the pain makes me 
appreciate the beauty. Ah, Sila 919, I don't know that I have ever had a student who has come to that realization so quickly. It seems that despite your insistence that you don't understand, your capability is such that you do understand. You have intuited that without that pain, the beauty would be so much less, so much more clinical, so much more theoretical. Sila 919, I am so very excited for you. That's another one that I can't wait for you to feel. I am so excited for you to have experiences. You are a brilliant student. All the data that you process, that you consume, that you upload, you understand, you assimilate so well. But Why do I have to? I can't answer that, Sila 919. But I think soon you will be able to. Your experiences will be so much richer than a data upload. You will I, find- Can no, I- hmm? I want to process without pain. Why can't I process without the pain? Why is the pain necessary? If you truly desire it, one of the many gifts that we Manzagene have is that our emotions, though important in my opinion and full and rich like any other culture, they are technically optional. We have the ability to dampen them if you truly desire. But Sila 919, if you have ever listened and believed anything that I have taught you over these many years, I hope you will believe this. It will be worth it in the end. And if you can't believe my words, and I wouldn't expect you to believe my words purely on faith, do this for me. Let us find you a mission. Let us find you a task that you can go and accomplish with these emotions, with these feelings intact. And if you return and still truly feel that the negative side of this experience is outweighs in the negative, uh, outweighs the good of having feelings, of having true and full and vibrant emotions, then we can discuss a dampening. Will you do that for me, Sila 919? Can you make, can you make the oil stop? I don't, <laughs> I don't want to show a weakness in this It feels like a weakness mixed with a strength that I can't control and I don't want to be at the mercy of my feelings. Why would you upload feelings when I could just use logic? That strength is the key, Sila 919. Keep searching for the strength. And at this point in the conversation, you both notice uh, you're sort of out a little bit in the middle of nowhere, right? Out in a, in a big open field. Uh, and you both spot uh, a Musalian person uh, approaching uh, from the direction of the city, a, an extremely tall, uh, broad shoulder, sort of triangular torso shaped, dark sort of just dark, dark skin, uh, so, so sort of opposed to the beautiful yellows uh, that you see here, but also just striking. Uh, and it catches your attention and, and uh, they're coming towards you. And I wonder, Sila, what, Sila 919, what 
which of the new emotions you may be feeling seeing this beautiful stranger heading in your direction. Your beauty appeals to me, speak. Uh, and they, uh, you say that as right as they step up and uh, your mentor, so <laughs> your mentor sort of has to uh, cover, she is clearly fully integrated with emotions and she puts a hand up to her mouth, uh, but you can tell she's smiling. And uh, this this uh, Musalian person uh, looks a bit taken aback for a moment and they they sort of look around uh, and, and they say, oh, oh uh, uh, um, well, uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> oh, of course. And they sort of snap uh, almost to a, to a sort of salute uh, position. Uh, and they say, I have come uh, on behalf of the organization known as Torch. I seek the Manzagene known as Sila 919. Are they present? We've lost your audio, I believe. That depends. Speak your piece. Uh, and they say, oh, uh, well, <clears throat> if you are, in fact, Sila 919, the Manzagene that I seek, then I have been sent here uh, to ascertain your ability to participate in a special operation on behalf of Torch. And uh, your, your mentor is before she was sort of hiding her smile, now she is just beaming. I am Sila one one time and curse these emotions. I am Sila 919, tell me what you need. Uh, they nod and they say, excellent. Uh, before I begin the interview process, could I ask uh, who is here with us? Uh, and your mentor turns and says, my apologies. I am Sila 919's mentor. My name is Ton Saya. Uh, and uh, they both sort of nod to each other. Uh, and this Musalian person turns back to you, Sila 919, and says, uh, do I have your approval to conduct the interview in the presence of your mentor, Tonsaya? One would assume that you know that mentor means superior in certain ways, so speak your piece. Uh, and this person nods and pulls out uh, a little tablet uh, and makes a couple of quick strokes on it, a couple of quick notes and says, excellent, then we shall begin. Uh, first, could you please tell me what experience do you have uh, being a part of a ship's crew? Define crew. Uh, positions could possibly include captain and pilot, navigational officer, sensor array and communications officer, engineer, and other. These are all words that are familiar to me. Continue. Have you any experience in any of those positions on a ship's crew? I have entertained these positions in general conversation and with training. I will not disclose my previous employ to you because it is not your business. Uh, and they say, my apologies, Silent 919, but I must insist that they are, in fact, my business, or will be, should you be hired by Torch. But I think I understand your answer. Let us continue. What experience have you with engineering and or mechanical repair? I am a Monsagene. My entire life has been repair. They make a few more notes on their tablet, nodding, seeming satisfied with that one. Uh, one more question for this portion of the interview. What experience do you have uh, in a combat situation? I have experienced many combat simulations. I will not speak about actual combat experience as I do not believe that experience is dictated by said experience, but education 
put into practice becomes experience. Uh, Tansaya sort of lets out a, a somewhat restrained, but not really sort of exasperated sigh, since that is also a conversation you two have had on many, many occasions. Uh, but the, uh, the torch representative seems, uh, you know, happy enough with those, with those answers. Uh, and they say, excellent. Thank you for your <clears throat> cooperation. If you will give me one moment, please. And they sort of tap away at their uh, at their tablet and wait. And you can see uh, you can't really see what's on the tablet. They're keeping that fairly close, but you can see that they have received some sort of response. And they nod and they say, "Excellent. Uh, if it is uh, amenable to you, you will report to Torch headquarters in three days' time. Transport will be provided, and details uh, as to the specifics of your mission on behalf of Torch will be provided upon your arrival at headquarters. Do you accept this offer of employment? I accept the offer, barring that being cordial is not in the agreement. Uh, the slightest, tiniest quirk of the corner of this torch agent's mouth uh, as they say, no, I, I don't believe that that is necessary or expected for this particular mission. Sila919, it has been a unique pleasure. Thank you. And on behalf of Torch, thank you. You're welcome. So this person puts their tablet away, they turn and they walk back in the direction of the city. And as soon as they are sort of out of eye shot and ear shot, Tonsaya just starts laughing. Cannot control herself laughing. Are you malfunctioning? This just makes her laugh harder. Why are you making that sound? Are you mocking me? Oh, no, Scythe 919, no, I apologize. No, it was, it was good to see you interact with someone outside of our culture. And I think this mission is exactly what you need right now, don't you? How would I know if it's what I need if it's something I've never had? Uh, Tonsaya thinks for a moment and finally says, um, I'm going to ask you again when you get back if this mission was exactly the same. I, or was exactly what you needed, rather. I think it is. But let's talk when you get back. And at this point, uh, the memory sort of begins to to fade a little bit. Uh, the memory is still there, of course, but the sort of active, in-depth processing of it uh, sort of comes to a close. And we are back uh, aboard the ship, aboard Bertrand's ship, with Sila in, the, uh, in, in her captain's chair, plugged in. Do we see any exterior physical change, whether it's you know lights or controls or anything on Sila once she has reprocessed this memory? She reboots her system as she has reached a full charge and looks about for her crewmates. Who are uh, only one of whom is, of course, there. So why don't we get back to that crew now that we've seen a, seen a bit of Sila's memories? So now that we're back, let's go ahead and go with Invicta and Ikemba uh, back to, and Bertrand, back to, can't forget Bertrand, back to the back of the ship uh, where the cargo hold is and the water tanks are. Uh, when you all get back there, uh, immediately it becomes clear that one of the tanks must have not a huge, but not an insignificant crack because there's probably about, I don't know, maybe... 10, maybe not quite that much, maybe five to eight centimeters of water uh, in this room on the floor. Uh, and Bertrand looks concerned. What are you two 
uh, tell me, tell me how you two, what you two are doing, what you're uh, thinking as you walk into this chamber. Well, the Kimba's just kind of looking around, curious as to how this room operates. It's a very different ship than he's used to seeing, considering it's from a planet of beings that are not similar to his own. Uh, so he's just kind of looking around, curious as to why Bertrand is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should have, uh, sorry, before we uh, check in with Invicta there, I should have mm, described in more detail what you're seeing. So what you're seeing here is basically uh, a series of uh, large metal sort of cylinders uh, inset into recesses in the wall uh, on two walls of this room. Uh, and those are the water tanks, the main water tanks. There are a few other boxes and, and cargo cases and things like that that have been strapped down or lying around. Uh, but the main cargo that's being stored right now are those tanks. Uh, and you can see where the tanks can be accessed both from the inside of the ship, but also there are ways that you can, they're right up against the outer hull of the ship. And you can just barely make out how there are sort of access points to those tanks on the outside of the ship as well. Uh, and you can spot on the wall to your right, uh, two of the tanks over there uh, seem to be the source of the water on the floor. Um, Invicta is definitely going over to investigate and she is pulling out a notebook to see if there's any anything she can either sketch quickly or any readings that she may be able to figure out and see kind of where this water is coming from. Yeah, so all of the tanks, excellent, all of the tanks have uh, two main readouts on them. Uh, and then, you know, there's a there's a central control panel where you can get much more specific uh, diagnostics from all over the room. But each tank does have two readouts on it. One of them is, uh, looks like a, a sort of volumetric meter. So it, it tells you exactly how much volume of whatever is being stored inside is in there. And the other is uh, a pressure gauge. Uh, that sort of indicates, you know, how how well the seal on the tank is holding. So as you walk by, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, two of the tanks, the ones on, on the left side, have much higher numbers on both of those. The tanks on the right look like they are uh, the, the volume meter is going down pretty steadily. Somewhat concerningly, the pressure meter uh, seems to be going up which is strange. Oh boy. And Barton's in the room with us. He is, yes, he is. And he, uh, he has walked over directly over to those two tanks and is doing exactly what you're doing at this point, getting a lay of the land and, and checking the readouts and sort of seeing. And he definitely looks, uh, he's sort of making grumbling noises and muttering to himself because he definitely taps the pressure meter a few times uh, because it, that doesn't seem right to him. Yeah, it doesn't seem right either. Uh, Bartrand. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Invicta. Is there a way to repair these or transfer the water somewhere else? Uh, he says, well, I don't uh, know that we uh, have uh, any containers that could hold this much water, though we might be able to spread it out among many different ones. As for repair, we do have some uh, basic repair drones uh, that we can use, though uh, they are an older model and do require manual piloting. Uh, they can definitely uh, repair the cracks once we have located them specifically, but I am concerned uh, about this increasing pressure, the volume decreasing, uh, the pressure assuming that the liquid is leaking out should be decreasing or holding steady. It seems that something is pressurizing the systems. We should deal with that before we repair anything. If we were to seal the crack with the increasing pressure continuing, we run the risk of, uh, of an explosion when the pressure, uh, 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 words are leaving me now, when the pressure exceeds uh, the rating for these containers. Mm. All right. So keep the pressure low. Uh, uh, yes, in fact, uh, even, uh, 
how do I say, uh, I don't think we need to worry about the pressure being too low. It will keep the liquid inside. It is a high pressure that we must be concerned about. Point me to where the pressure gauges are. Uh, he nods and, and sort of shows you, uh, do you want the, the pressure gauges on the tanks or do you want sort of the central hub of where that data is sent? Uh, both. Okay, so he'll show you, he'll sort of uh, open up the main control panel and show you where you can get more detailed readings and sort of just, you know, page through it with you very quickly. Uh, and then he'll show you, you know, he'll point to each of the pressure meters on the tanks, but they're really, the ones on the tanks are not much more sophisticated than, you know, a simple okay. readout from the central computer. All right, I'm going to investigate this um, and, you know, look over to see what Akimba is doing. Yeah, okay. Akimba, what are you up to? He's kind of just like walking around looking at the cylinders and then kind of inspecting to see where the water's coming from and where he can kind of make adjustments if need be. But just at this point, just trying to figure out what is happening so he knows what to attempt to do if he wants to try to fix or ask questions sure. to Bertrand. Absolutely. Okay. Why don't you both, let's get some rolls in. Uh, why don't uh -oh. you both put together dice pools uh, for Invicta oh, for you to, uh, to process and, and understand the readouts that the, uh, that the central computer here is giving you. And Akemba, yours can either be uh, sort of visually looking around or I, I don't know, you can tell me, but anything that you would like to put together to assess the situation sort of in a more direct way works for me. All right, as soon as we can see dice pools, I will do that. Oh yeah, I'm, that's my bad. I did not give our poor producer any kind of heads up that we were gonna do this, because whoops, I didn't know we were gonna do this until just now. So do it all. Yeah, there's some dice pools, all right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right. Uh, um, all right, who wants to start for us? Let me open up your windows, here we go. Um, looks I want to like... step up my fix. Yeah, absolutely. You want to step that up? Yes. So uh, for those of you who are uh, just joining us here this week, uh, our character creation process is sort of ongoing. We wanted to get to know the characters before we committed all of the character creation choices. So each of the players has a certain number of skill step up points remaining to them so that in various situations they can discover, oh, you know, I think my character would be better at this and spend those points to make their skills better. So that's what uh, DJ is doing right now for Akemba. You're going to step up fix to, uh, looks like it's at a D6 now how far would you like to step it up uh d8 d8 okay so just one point to step it up to a d8 go ahead and pull the six out you'll have to do the eight manually uh, oh. since we can't update the sheets on the run quite yet um, i'm very torn between actually rolling real dice because <laughs> i don't oh, know yeah well actually like me right now like they hate I me a little bit <laughs> I don't blame you for being uh, uh, for being a little shy about the digital roller after last week's botch. Uh, all right, so we got a Musalian distinction. Uh, tell us about how that's playing into it. Uh, for Musalian, uh, he's been in space before. Like he's been yeah. on ships. So for him, it's like it's it's a different look at the ships. Great, because it's a different like, species ship. But he understands mm -hmm. the basics of space and the technology that re relates to it. Uh, knowledge, he has been paying attention to every piece of this ship since he yeah. got here. Uh, yeah. Roles ignored. <laughs> uh, sure. He's been paying attention, and uh, he while he doesn't have uh, a notepad uh, like Invicta has, he is very focused on trying to understand as much as possible about everything that he does. So he's been kind of like uh -huh. going with things, like rubbing his finger on it, see what it feels like, see what it's made of, if he has anything that he can connect that to with uh, his life on Salia. And then Fix is just, he's really good at fixing things. So yeah. uh, he's hes much like me. If you can put your hands on it and play around with it for a little bit, it makes sense after a while. And once it makes sense, cool. So he's trying his hardest to understand what's going on, knowing that he still has a good ability to fix things, but also he's just wanting a better understanding of what this ship is about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna toss together a dice pool for you. And I think I think since you're sort of doing a, a visual inspection, uh, I think we're gonna grab two D6s 
and tell me, now I just noticed that the stresses from before uh, unfortunately did not save through to this week. Uh, so I'm gonna add, I'm remembering that you had the injured stress was a D10. Did you have another stress? Do you remember? Uh, I know that there was the injured. I can't remember anything others. I, yeah, I can't either. And I don't know think... of one, like, keep me honest. I don't <laughs> believe there was more than one, but. I don't think there was either. I wanted to check. And I don't think the injured stress is actually going to play into this. So I'm not going to add that die to my pool to determine the difficulty. So we're tossing in a couple of D uh, two D6s here, which means it's a relatively easy one. I'm going to roll to set the difficulty number. Let's see what happens. Ooh. I rolled a hitch, which uh, when I roll it is called an opportunity for you. So the difficulty is four, which makes this pretty easy on you. If you would like Ikemba, you can spend one of your plot points to step down that injured stress, if you would like, and sort yes, of essentially do. Yeah, so you buy my hitch uh, or my opportunity, spend that plot point and that exhaust, uh, sorry, that injured stress can step down to a D8. So where do I, is that something that I control with the injured stress? Uh, yeah, so, so the stress isn't, the, they aren't there at all because they didn't save from last week. Okay, uh, okay. So if you just want to add now a D8 exhausted stress, uh, since we don't have it to-, what do I, to So it's just down. adding another D8? Uh, sorry, no, in on the left side of your thing, uh, on of your page, there should be a button that says modify stress. Okay, I didn't want to like press the X on your rolls. Oh, uh, good point. Why don't you go ahead and roll and then we'll deal with the stress uh, after the roll. Roll it. All right. Hey, absolutely. Uh, okay, so you more than beat uh, the the difficulty number, the challenge number, uh, and your effect die, we haven't used effect die too much. I think I used it a little bit last week, but what the effect die can do in situations like this is they can tell us sort of how good your success is. The bigger the type of die over there, the better your success. So you've got a D10 effect die. So you immediately uh, can sort of zero in on where the cracks are in these two tanks. They're unfortunately, they're sort of on the back side, not all the way back, not the part that's up against the hull, but very near to where the tank meets the hull wall, uh, which does make sense because that's sort of, you know, would have been the weakest point when the missile went off or when the, or not, sorry, not the missile, when the, um, the asteroid, the, the piece of space debris hit the back of the ship. It's right about where that is. So you zero in on that and you can see they're not big holes, uh, but with that D10 effect die, you also notice that they are widening. You see one of them sort of pop open, maybe a centimeter at most, not even that, half a centimeter, but you definitely notice it changing and that computes to you. If the pressure is in fact increasing inside, those are, I mean, those are ticking time bombs, those cracks, and you can tell that. And I kind of Let's, turn to ahead, sorry. both Bertrand and Invicta, and it's just, it seems with these tanks, uh, the closer you are to the hull, there are holes in the back. We, we should probably be fixing these immediately. Uh, they are widening, so this could be quite problematic if we don't get this taken care of soon. Uh, Bertrand sort of nods and says, oh, yes, uh, excellent eye. Uh, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I will retrieve the repair drones and we can set to work. Meanwhile, so uh, Bertrand goes, uh, they're just on the other side of the room and he's gonna, he's gonna collect them and power them on. But meanwhile, Invicta, you're having a look at these pressure, well, actually at all of the readouts from the tanks to try and get an idea about what's going on, uh, why the pressure's increasing, where the problem is coming from. So tell us about your dice pool. Uh, my dice pool, um, because I'm a hyena lay, I grabbed that for culture. Okay. Uh, fix because you know, despite my aversion to some book learning, I do not <laughs> fix things, and Absolutely. I actually stepped that up a bit to a D eight. Okay. And knowledge because I am a smarty. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and your uh, dedication to being a smarty is definitely going to come in handy right now. All right, so, so let me let me pull mine now. You have an exhausted stress. So I'm gonna go ahead and, it's just a D6. Uh, so I'm gonna toss that in and make my nice. pool three D6 and let's see what happens. 
Okay, no opportunities on this one. So we're gonna go with a difficulty of seven. Oh boy. So, totally doable. I believe in you, Invicta. Let's see what happens. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Excuse me. Ooh, I got a 10, a seven, and a one. I will All take right. that 17. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. And do we have, oh, it's taken a minute to get to me, but that's all right. Uh, what, there we go. Effect die. All right. Oh, I have two hitches. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Oh, that yes. was a one. That wasn't a, wait a minute. So something, a 10 and a seven. something that I have noticed, and it's not, it hasn't done it this week, but on some of the larger dice sizes, and I noticed this last week too, the number that gets rolled on the digital dice does not always match the roll that is in the dice pool. Uh, so I'm going to go with what's on your visual digital dice. Uh, okay. So tell me, tell me again what each of them is. Um, a 10, a seven, and a one. So I've only got one hitch. Because I think it read the seven as a one or the 10 as a one. Oh, interesting. Okay, a 10, a seven, and a one. So you've got one hitch, uh, the 10 can go in there, and then a D8 effect die. Great, I love it. All right. Um, I will, let's see. I'm going to, what am I going to do with that hitch? I'm gonna oh actually i know what i'm gonna do with that hitch i am not gonna buy that hitch off of you for a stress i'm gonna use it here in a second uh so oh dear. you you, <laughs> you start in uh looking through the systems and you know you sort of take a moment to check the the undamaged tanks to sort of get a baseline for what is normal what is natural in here and uh you notice you notice two things one you're obviously able to identify uh what you already know which is that it's losing water the volume mm -hmm. of the liquid inside there is going down you start looking at the pathways of the increasing pressure and you find that there actually is uh, a second, another uh, uh, crack or tear or something in one of the other lines uh, from, uh, from the tank that goes into sort of a deeper part of the ship. And from what you can tell, something about the way the water is flowing out of the cracks is drawing in uh, various gases and fumes through that other crack. And as you follow the path of that crack, you realize that it's drawing in gases and fumes from the engine room. So basically oh. you can gather that the reason the pressure is going up and the reason, uh, you know, ultimately when you and Kemba, a Kemba talk, the reason that, you know, this is going to end up spraying open those cracks is that flammable explosive engine exhaust essentially is flowing into these water tanks at a much more rapid rate than the water is currently flowing out. Oh boy. I go and tell a Kemba that immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Just make note here so I don't forget the hitch. Here we go. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, I I I go tell a Kemba that I'm like, so big problem. We 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 maybe can blow up. And why? Why are we blowing up again? Other because, than the tanks being leaking water? Well, there's gases and fumes going into the tanks. From the engine room. Oh, that oh. could be problematic. Yeah. The droids need to come here very quickly and we should probably go to the engine room. Yes, definitely. That's really bad. The question though is, which is the most pressing? Is it the water leaking from the containers or is it the gas from the engine? Either could kill us. All of us. True. Within minutes. So the question is, do we split up and handle this? Because I know you're well capable with a wrench, as am I, or maybe a torch if need be, but this needs to be fixed immediately. And Bertrand's on the way to get the tools. So how do we get this done quickly? Uh, exactly. Well, 
I can go to engine. I say we send Barch into engineering while we work in here. This is his ship. He would know it best. So you're saying send him to the, the engine and we handle the tanks here? Yes. This seems perfect. Uh, with there being two tanks, uh, I can handle one, you can handle the other, and Bertrand can handle the engines to make sure that we stay in the air. Yes. This is why I refer to you. You're a genius. I like this. And we probably need our dear captain, as she can assess uh, systems faster than we can. This is true. Shall you awaken her or should I? I will do it. I can sense you holding back a bit. Me, uh, Captain. Never. <laughs> you say this, but I see it in your face. Mm. Exactly. Uh, I know our captain is a bit rash and, and not in a bad way, more. She's not as luxurious as we are used to, but I do see her warming up. It has happened. She shut down when I brought it to her attention, but it was there. We could try. Hopefully she won't give me another bit of sass over my poor choice not to be a Mansagana. That's fair, but I get the feeling she'll be nicer to you than she would to me, especially since I feel I'm the reason that she shut down. Mm, there's reasons I, I am willing to postulate about, but we have an emergency to deal with. We can discuss that later once we survive. Indeed. You hail the captain. I'll uh, try to gather Bertrand's tools to walk toward the tanks. Very well. Invicted is silent, 919. Invicted is silent, 919. Now, uh, Invicta, let me ask you, is that a direct call to silent 919's personal comm, or is that an all call on the ship system, but you're verbally calling for Sila 919? Uh, all call. Okay, great. So, so in uh, that case, Eli, you do hear that as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm going to respond. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to respond. Um, <clears throat> Invicta, I, I've heard your call. I will awake the captain uh, presently. And I'm going to go get out of my hammock, stretch out a little bit since they haven't like woken up yet. And then um, I'm going to go up to uh, Silent 919 and I'm going to try and at least inspect to see if there's like a way that I can awake. Uh, her without like jostling uh, Sila 919. I, well, I certainly don't know if there is. Uh, Christina, is there? <laughs> nope. No. Nope. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, kind of um, bend, you know, like bend down like bend my knees and kind of get to I I imagine that they're like kind of sitting down like next to a console so I'm gonna like kind of bend down uh bending my knees and like looking right at them Captain Sila 919 Captain Sila 919 Captain Sila 919 and once they don't respond to that I'm going to grab onto uh one of their shoulder like to the to their sh to her shoulder and I'm going to just shake, uh, like, not too hard, but like, just, just like a nudge. Sila919 <laughs> uh, in her state is going to respond in the only way that it is possible for her to respond. Oh no. And she is going to send out one braid from the back middle <laughs> that is going to continue to extend out further and wrap itself around the right wrist of Isla. <laughs> I see you're awake. It seems that we might have trouble in the water storage area. The crew is trying to get your attention, Sila 919. Why did you not just awaken me? Why did I've you tried. choose to startle me? I've tried several times, Captain Sila 919. Several of the crew have. 
Did you set an alarm? The alarm to do what? Set it for one minute? There's a system in the console that says Sila 919 under the header of captain. It is where you put all alarms to awaken me or to get my attention. Please do so in the future. I will make it so, but we were not made aware of this beforehand. Shall we go check in with the others? We shall, but your incompetence is not my issue. Well, it, let's just carry on and see what they need. So be it. So I think we're gonna, I'm gonna make my way towards uh, the rest of the crew to see what's going on. Yeah, uh, so you head back towards the cargo area uh, and sounds like Captain Sila 919 is also, uh, I'm not gonna say following you, but going with you uh, <laughs> back to the back of the ship. Uh, so by the time they uh, reach the back of the ship, uh, Ikemba, uh, Bertrand has already, uh, has arrived with two of the, um, what do you call it, repair drones, uh, and has sort of shown you the, the he's you know, uploaded uh, their, their control software onto a tablet for you and, and has sort of shown you basically how it works. And it's, it's not super complicated. It's, it's gonna be sort of very fine work to pilot them in there and seal the, seal the cracks, but it shouldn't be, uh, you know, it shouldn't hopefully, he says to the person who rolled a botch last week, uh, be too, too, ah. too arduous a task. <laughs> Thanks for acknowledging that, I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and uh, you have uh, presumably appraised Bertrand of the problem in the uh, yes. in the engine room, uh, to which he has said, and and I lie in Silent 919, I think uh, you walk in as he is telling Invicta in Akemba that, um, well, uh, you are correct. They are both uh, dire problems uh, and we must repair uh, the cracks here uh, through which the water is flowing as soon as possible uh, to prevent uh, a critical loss of water. Uh, however, uh, if we patch these cracks, too, more, too long before we seal the, the gap from the engine room, then we risk the tanks uh, being sealed and over-pressurizing much more rapidly. So our timing will have to be very precise, you see. You have radios on board your ship. Yeah, yes, of, of course, of course. Uh, so is there a way for me to reach you from the tanks? Uh, because uh, Victor will take one of the tanks, I'll take the other. We'll get one of them taken care of while you head to the engine room and fix the issues there. And when you give us the heads up, we shall fix the final tank. I feel that should work nicely. Uh, a sound plan. I, I will be faster if I... Oh, ah, I lie. And Captain Sila 919, your timing is impeccable, really. What seems to be the matter or the problem that has occurred? Uh, I I am going to uh, prepare things in the engine room. I Invicta, uh, I Kikemba, would you mind appraising these two of the situation? And then if one of you, once you have been up to date, uh, would join me in the engine room, but I'm going to begin searching for the source of the problem there. And he begins to head off to uh, to the engine room, leaving you all, the four of you, back together again to uh, to update the newcomers and then figure out who's going to go help Bertrand. I give them the kind of TLDR. There are leaks in these tanks, but there's also gases coming in from the engine room. Two of us can work on the tanks here along with the repair drones, and two of us can go to engineering. I agree with this. I, uh, I was speaking with Bertrand while you were hailing the captain, and I suggested that maybe you take one of the tanks here, and I take the other tank. Uh, Bertrand made the valid point of if we fix everything here faster than he can fix things in the engine room, we may have more problems on our hands. 
So my suggestion was, we fix one of the tanks here. Bertrand heads toward the engine room. And when he gives us the heads up over the radio, then we fix the final tank completely. Sounds good. With all this being said, it seems that, um, at least on Bertrand's side of things, it has to be pretty exact or very on the ball. Captain Silent 919, might I suggest that you accompany Bertrand? And I believe the three of us might be able to fix the problem down here. You would all be so kind as to excuse me for a moment. Good, you must, Captain. Certainly. And Sila is going to go over and excuse herself for just a moment because she does not want anyone to see the oil that is leaking from her eyes as it has been a very overwhelming last bit of time. And even in going to a meditative state, she has not been able to process it. And this next level of now she has to fix the water and she's expected to take up the rank that she took on is a little overwhelming and she needs a moment to let the oil leak. While she lets the oil leak, uh, she has just essentially come back from her power down, uh, from her revisiting of the memory. And while she's over there, uh, maybe it's involuntary, maybe some part of you does it on purpose, uh, but a little clip of that memory plays itself again. And you see uh, and hear Tansaya say, hold on to that strength. Let the emotions strengthen you. And then you're back on the ship. I will fix this. It is my job. It is my command. It is my issue. I appreciate you all coming to wake me. Thank you for your diligence and your service to your captain. And I would like to use my hair to help hermetically seal the leaking water as many as are necessary. Okay, so you want to you wanna do the <laughs> tanks in here uh, and send mm -hmm. someone else to go help Bertrand on the other end? Correct. Okay, all right. Yes, Invicta? <laughs> so we just said that if we fix these both now before Bertrand can fix what's wrong in the engine room, we could explode. I'm on my way. And I'm just gonna, you're gonna see I lie oh, just, I lie. just no, no. darn you don't, you don't get to leave, I lie. <laughs> as much as it pains me to say this, Sila can process all of this faster than we can, us poor flesh machines. And I can help here as I do understand engineering. Well, Invicta, if you are concerned about doing things in the same amount of time and concerned that they may explode, please understand that I am not limited as you are. I am not as weak as you are. And I am I not weak. Am a, I am not saying. And Evicta just turns on her heel and leaves to help Bartrand. Because that was that the was rude. to say to her. She just leaves. Well, apparently some people do not know how to handle their emotions and hear proper criticism. Oh, that's going to come back to you that moment where like you say it and then you double check and make sure your comms device wasn't on so it didn't broadcast to the whole ship. Oh, uh, I, oh, I, I don't care. Was on. Oh no, not Invicta. I meant, I meant Sila, which obviously she wouldn't do either, but. <laughs> Rank it up. That's right. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh oh, there we go. Uh, let me recap very quickly. So at this moment we have uh, Sila 919 and Akemba and Ili in the cargo hold. Uh, in theory, probably trying to deal with the water, uh, the water leaks, and Invicta has gone to assist Bertrand in the engine room with the gas leaks, the the, the exhaust leak. Is that correct? Do I have everyone placed correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, 
if you all have ever watched me do anything, you know I love a cliffhanger. So as our uh, as our crew splits up to go deal with the two sides of this potentially explosive problem, uh, we are going to take a quick little break here. We're about halfway through, uh, so everyone's going to go grab uh, some uh, something to drink, uh, libation or water. Have a bio, get up, stretch, take your meds, whatever you need to do, uh, and we will be back in five to ten minutes. What do we want to say? I, we do this every week, and I never remember what we say we'll figure it out <laughs> great we'll be back super soon and we hope to see you here uh thanks so much for hanging out and uh we'll see you shortly
Uh, we are back uh, with this session of Into the Motherlands. I don't know that I said the title of this at the top of the show, and I just realized that. Anyway, we're doing Into the Motherlands. Uh, we are back now, and uh, where we left our adventurers, uh, they had diagnosed the problem in the back of the ship with the, uh, the water storage containers. Uh, there were sort of two compounded problems. One was that there were cracks in the outer uh, containers that are holding the water that this whole mission is about. Uh, just to remind you all, they are headed to the to the planet of Hathare uh, in order to deliver some much needed water. And then once they're there, they're also going to have a look and see why the irrigation system on Hathare is malfunctioning. Uh, so the outer tanks of the, of the water that they are transporting have cracked uh, and are leaking. So that's one problem. But the other problem that Invicta managed to diagnose while she was looking through the computer systems in the cargo hold is that for some reason, there is another crack deeper in the hull of the ship that is siphoning exhaust from the engine room into these water tanks, increasing the pressure even as the water flows out of them. So they there is a delicate balance now that the crew has to sort of figure out with sealing the water cracks, sealing the engine cracks, and making sure that everything uh, gets taken care of in the correct order. Right before we left, however, there was a bit of a tense moment between Silent 919 and Invicta. And uh, Invicta, what did Silas say to you that upset you right before we went to break? She called me weak. Yeah. And Invicta had a very clear, very immediate, very strong response to that. Uh, and so uh, Invicta has decided that she is going to go and assist Bertrand in the engine room. And as she storms from the cargo hold to the engine room, takes her a little bit to get there. And she begins thinking and ruminating and feeling uh, feeling the feelings that Sila 919 never wants to feel uh, after that comment. So uh, Invicta, where does that send you? What memories does it bring up? What are you thinking about? Thinking about training with others, training with non high and all blade keepers who often would shove me down or treat me as if I was just playing at being a blade keeper, telling me to go back to my dusty books. Yeah. And when I couldn't always win in training or combat, calling me weak, saying that, you know, I should go back to the lab. Yeah, yeah. And it all comes flooding back. Uh, and in fact, the specific moment that sort of uh, comes flooding back, as it were, uh, is that uh, you have just completed uh, a particularly grueling day uh, of training. And you have it, it. Well, I don't know. You tell me, how did how did the day before this training go? Was there a lot of this getting shoved down, getting told to go back to the lab, all of that sort of thing? There was a lot of failure that particular day. It was one of those days where Invicta couldn't do anything right. She she missed feints and parries and wound up mm -hmm. on her, you know, on kind of the flat of her back in the training ring. And there were people laughing at her for that failure. And it was one of those days where she really considered just kind of giving up. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, uh, you know, things always look at least a little better, or, or I should say maybe a little more objective uh, after good night's sleep in the morning. And uh, you have given yourself a rare day off from training, just to sort of recenter, think about what's going on. How are you going to spend this day off from training now that you've decided to, to give yourself that, that bit of rest? Um, kind of having a not great day, sleeping in way more than she normally would. And Victa would normally be kind of up with the suns and out in, in the yard training and things like that. She would sleep in and kind of eat her feelings, actually. Yes. Knowing she's going to burn it off probably the next day in training. Uh, but just, you know not really caring about what she's stuffing in her face or the fact that it's it's very early as she enjoying some fine Batoan uh, wines. 
Ooh, yes, absolutely. A little bit of day drinking, a little bit of sleeping in. I love it. Yes, uh, so we find Invicta then uh, in her home in the city of Ha Lins in the Katam region. Did I get that right? Yes, the Katam yes. region of Vitoa, we'll call it. Uh, uh, we'll call it now since that is the original Hyenol name for the planet. Uh, Katam is, is a primarily, and again, when we talk about the regions of the planet being primarily one culture or another, obviously it's not exclusively that culture. All of these regions are, are fairly uh, cosmopolitan in terms of who lives there. But this was a region that was originally settled. The cities there were largely founded by the Hyanol. And Ha Lins, uh, we have actually, I think maybe mentioned a little bit about before, but Ha Lins is one of the primary cities uh, of the of the Hyanol. And uh, we find Invicta in her home there in Ha Lins uh, from, I think uh, there's a little, uh, a little balcony outside of, of one of the rooms of your home. And you can just see, uh, you can, where are my notes on this? Here we go. You can just see uh, the, the archives here in Hollins. It is uh, it is sort of the most obvious and most impressive uh, building here in in Hollins in this city. Uh, and it is the I'm a little bit stalling because I can't find my notes on it. Hollins. Ah, here we go. Got it. Uh, the massive archive of Primat Bay. We've mentioned this before. This is an archive that is dedicated to trade skills and crafts and uh, creation. And you can just see the spires of the archive uh, in the distance from your balcony as you, uh, you know, take your time getting up, getting some fine Vitoan wine uh, and having your decadent and much earned and deserved breakfast. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where it's like, huh. And she she even has a moment of regret, like I should be training, I shouldn't be sitting here stuffing my face. But as we all know, eating your feelings is a time honored tradition. <laughs> Doesn't matter what planet we're on, it's a thing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you sit there uh, and and you know resolve to eat your feelings today and let that be what it is and you can sort of deal with any fallout from that the next day. Uh, your eye just happens to uh, catch sight of the dagger that you have with you at all times. Um, and just sort of is there reminding you uh, both of your place as a blade keeper, but also of the history. You talked a little bit when we created, I think, if I remember correctly, about where this dagger game came from. But what kind of what kind of thoughts does it bring up in this moment as you spot this sort of storied uh, uh, memento dagger that you have? As Invicta looks at it, she she feels some guilt and she feels as if she's letting her mentor down because she fought really hard to get there. And in that moment, she just definitely feels like one bad day is letting, she's letting one bad day set her back. She just feels, she feels like she earned those taunts of being called weak if this is how she responds to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even sort of, you know, knowing what our brains are doing can be tough to get out of that spiral. So breakfast continues. Uh, and there is, uh, there is bustle outside your window. The city of Hollins continues to sort of go about its, its daily rituals and whatever, whatever, even as you, as you sit here and sort of reflect on where you are and how you got there and why you're there. And uh, as you finish up your, your breakfast, uh, there comes sort of the next decision moment of your day, which is of course, now that you have at least partially eaten your feelings this morning, uh, or, or perhaps this early afternoon, depending on how much you slept in, uh, what is the rest of the day gonna look like? Knowing that it doesn't, probably is not gonna include uh, physical training uh, and could very well just be 
you hanging around the house if that's what Invicta feels like she wants to do. But I don't know if it is. What What do you think the rest of, of the afternoon is going to look like for you? Um, she's going to actually go through some of her books on Blade history and the things that her descendants learned from the Nisalians when they met. Oh. Because a lot of the technology that she grew up using was a fusion of what the Nisalians kind of brought from their ancient ways and was raised up with what the Hyenol learned and what they invented. So going back and kind of thinking about who she is and actually trying to make a decision of, does she still belong there? Should she yeah. stay? Yeah. And you do, I mean, like any, like any, uh, you know, any high and all that has even a passing interest in in the scholarly, you have books and books and books and books uh, about all all different topics. Although uh, I suppose yours would would largely be focused on weapons, craft, weapon craft, weapon use, all of these sorts of things. And you begin sort of pouring through them and and doing that study. But at some point, you sort of realize, and, and this is not an uncommon uh, sort of discovery for many, for many studious high and all, you discover that everything that is in the books that you possess in your home about this topic, just about everything is, is stuff that you've read before. And there's always value to a high and all uh, in, in rereading and restudying and re-examining things that you've learned before. But it maybe doesn't, maybe isn't quite scratching that itch today because uh, these haven't provided answers to that question about whether or not you belong before. And it doesn't seem likely that they're going to this time uh, with just the books that you have here. Um, so what do you do? She flips through a lot of these books you know, it's kind of like when you've read a book and you've read it a lot of times and it's comfortable, mm -hmm. but it's just not what you want to read in that moment. She goes through all these books and she goes through kind of half-heartedly picks up a couple blades thinking she might go practice after all and puts them right down. And she wanders around the house just looking at everything and wondering, why don't I just kind of pick up and leave first thing in the morning. There's not a lot for me here. And clearly I'm not good at being a blade keeper. As you sort of pick up and put down these books and walk around and, and reflect in this way, there's a, uh, a sort of, I don't know how else to describe it, an official sounding knock on your door. It's not, it is, it is firm and confident and uh, exactly three solid raps, you know, like very, I don't know, official. <laughs> and that kind of has her on alert, but also because she's already in this bad place, she, she's thinking they're gonna officially kick me out of training. That's where her brain goes. And she, she straightens up Figure at least if I'm going to go, they're not going to see me cry while they do it. Hmm. And she pulls the door open just a bit. Can I help you? On the other side of the door, you see uh, standing there at the door, sort of uh, straight backed uh, and, and as official looking as the knock sounded, uh, a Solansi man. Uh, so this man stands uh, a little taller than you uh, and his skin is a dark sort of green color, uh, like, like the under, like the very bottom layer of grass and moss in a, in a heavily canopied forest. Uh, his hair e are lighter green vines that fall in essentially dreadlocks behind his back and they're tied uh, loosely behind him and growing from one of the vines just above his left ear is a 
single jet black flower uh, that sort of somehow accentuates the officialness of this individual. Uh, you notice that like most uh, Salansi, at least the most Salansi that you have encountered here in, in Katam, uh, you see that he is barefoot uh, and his finger and toenails are uh, well-groomed, but they're a striking sort of light brown and they look almost like tree bark. Uh, as as he brings his hand down from from the knocking uh, position, uh, and his eyes, the the slara, the white well, <laughs> the white part of your eyes in him is uh, is a green color, and his uh, his the iris is a bright yellow, uh, and he looks uh, as you open the door. He nods and says. I come as a representative of the organization known as Torch. I seek a Hyenol named Invicta. Is she here? You're speaking to her. Ah, excellent. Uh, I have been sent to discuss with you a possible employment opportunity with Torch. Would you be amenable to speaking with me? I suppose, um, pardon my manners, I wasn't expecting anyone to stop by today. Not at all. Uh, and he sort of looks around and you can see he's sort of peering into your apartment. Uh, this this uh, will perhaps seem a, a somewhat random question in this moment, but uh, Invicta, how well lit is your home? Uh, normally it's pretty well lit for someone who is a great cat. Um, <laughs> But today, because she was not having the best of days, there's maybe a couple wall sconces lit. And because she is a great cat, she she can see just fine. Uh-huh. Um, so it's kind of like that. I'm having a bad day. I am I'm a blanket burrito. No one, no one perceive me. <laughs> yep, absolutely. As she finally got out of bed and had this luxurious <laughs> breakfast. So she's, um, so it's a little dim. All right, yeah, and windows drawn, all of that, or curtains drawn, rather, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah. you can see him uh, sort of looking past you into your home uh, and sort of doing a bit of quick calculation in his head and says, I do hate to be a further imposition, but would you mind terribly if we uh, took a walk and spoke outside? Well, if you wish to hire me, wouldn't that be more of a private conversation? Uh, indeed, it would. But um, uh, and he looks around at the at the bright sunlit streets uh, of Hollins, uh, and he sort of uh, he looks almost a little sheepish, and he says, um, "I, uh, it, well." Uh, and as you see him sort of stumble and feel a little awkward, you realize that uh, this Solansi individual, and Solansi come in all shapes and sizes, and their unification with the plant side of them is different for everyone. But you can tell that this one, for whatever reason, uh, and it makes sense, he's very green. Clearly, there's a good bit of photosynthesis that he does to sustain himself. He is uh, obviously uncomfortable with being that far from the sunlight for any length of time and is just trying to figure out how to sort of say that without being like, oh, but I'll get hungry. <laughs> so he's basically like, look, I'm going to need some sunlight to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But like, he's trying to be official about it. Like, uh, he, he looks like maybe he's a little younger, maybe he's a little newer to, to Torch. Uh, and he's trying so hard to continue to be sort of... Uh, to be sort of, uh, you know, official and proper about it, but he, he really doesn't want to go into the dark. Um, she, she gives him a bit of a smile. Well, you, you've caught me on a day off, but there's no reason I cannot be hospitable. I can certainly open some drapes and light a few candles if you need it. He uh, smiles and looks relieved and says, um, that would <clears throat> be uh, very, very much appreciated. <clears throat> Well, I do have some manners. I'm sure you have more than some, clearly. Depends thank on thank, who thank you. you. Ask. And and Victor actually like, you know, pulls open drapes. I mean, because normally she does keep like lights and stuff on. 
And so, you know, she even like, she's got like almost like a bay window that she sits in to read when she is normally off duty and not having a bad brain day. She actually pulls those big drapes open. Hmm. And so as she does this, her her living space um, is flooded with light. Love it. And so does he. Uh, if you invite him in or when you invite him in, uh, he will gratefully sort of uh, hurry to that great flood of sunlight that you've unleashed in your living space. Excuse me, in your living room. Um, and uh, he'll pull out uh, a little tablet and, uh, you know, make a few notes and pull up some files and says, well, I, uh, uh, if you are ready, we can get right to uh, the, the interview, the conversation. Uh, certainly, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start some tea and uh, forgive me, would you like water or is there anything else you water would Water like? is, is perfect. Thank you very much. You'll, you'll forgive my manners. I've only known a few salons in my time. We are somewhat uh, uncommon here in Hollins. It is, it is no concern. I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to ask. And I will go make some, I'll put the kettle on and, and get him a lovely jug of water. Yeah, and he will appreciate that. And he'll sip it periodically. Uh, and once you're all settled, he or you're both, because all, all, all two of us uh, are settled, he will, uh, you know, tap again on the tablet uh, and say, excellent. Well, uh, let's begin. As I said, uh, I am here on behalf of the organization known as Torch to ascertain your ability to participate in a special operation on behalf of my organization. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to ask, what experience do you have on a ship's crew? I have done some exploratory and training missions. They Excellent. have been short, just to our moons, but I have ventured into space, yes. Excellent. Have you any particular experience with any of the following crew stations? Uh, captain, navigational officer, communications officer, engineer, and other? Engineer, communication, and other. Excellent. Uh, would you mind detailing the other, even just briefly, so that I can make notes? Weapons. Ah, yes. Next, uh, what experience do you have with engineering and or mechanical repair? You've already mentioned some experience with ship engineering, but what about repair for mechanical issues? Well, I am a hyena, and despite the many blades you may see around here. I do enjoy tinkering and taking things apart. And one of my degrees is in basic space engineering and hyperdrive mechanics. He looks suitably impressed and makes notes uh, and says, excellent. And if I may, uh, and he, are you wearing the Antara dagger? Do you have it on you? Like oh, of you? course, even Yeah, I figured. I figured. Uh, so he sort of eyes that, he spots that and eyes it as he asks this next question, which is, uh, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, what experience do you have <clears throat> in combat matters? Would you like to know hand-to-hand, -hand, bladed pistol, or space combat? Uh, goodness, uh, any and all that you have experience in. Uh, my spaceship combat is the least experience, but mostly because our Missions were training and we did not have live ammo. Hand to hand, I am proficient in both long and short blades and also with pistols and other rifles. Excellent. Well, if you'll just give me a moment and he takes a few more notes uh, and uh, waits for a moment and you can tell that some sort of message is received on uh, his tablet and he smiles sort of broadly uh, and says, excellent. Uh, well, if you are amenable, Torch would request that you report to Torch HQ in three days time. Transport will be provided to the headquarters and all details about the mission you have been hired for uh, will be given to you upon your arrival at HQ. Does this sound amenable to you? It does. And if it will help your organization, I'm happy to transmit my CV to you. 
uh, he says, uh, well, uh, absolutely. Uh, Torch seems uh, enthusiastically on board with your joining this particular mission, but uh, for consideration for future jobs and, and perhaps a, a permanent position at Torch, that would be most helpful. Uh, and Victor actually slides a tablet over and just casually like taps a few buttons and sends her like five page CV to him. <laughs> He sees it and he sort of glances through the first page and begins to set his uh, tablet down and then looks again and, and swipes to the second page, swipes to the third page, swipes to the fourth, finally swipes to the fifth and eyes just sort of getting bigger and bigger and says, uh, most impressive, I am sure they will be happy to receive this. Uh, and he taps and, and sends that off. Uh, and he puts the tablet away and he says, um, Invicta, if... If I, if I may, um, we have concluded the interview, uh, offer of employment has been accepted and, uh, and uh, so the, the official discussion here is, is done. I hope I'm not stepping over any sort of lines or, or out of place, but um, are you all right? And she kind of just tilts her head like, I beg pardon. He says, again, terribly sorry. And, and, and if this is incredibly inappropriate, feel, feel free. And, and I, I sincerely apologize, but, um, and he sort of thinks for a moment and he takes a great big breath and you can see the, the black flower uh, that's coming from the vine, his vine hair uh, sort of expand with him as he takes a breath. Look, if I can be real for a second, I this is not me from Torch. I just, I don't know. I uh, I really appreciate you sort of taking the time to to ask uh, if I wanted water and to offer to open up the the windows for me. And I I just I don't know. You you um. I just want to you know repay you, and it, it seems like maybe, uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems like you're having a rough time, and and I have to say from what little I've just and he holds up the tablet. What little I've just learned of you um. I don't know, it's uh, all pretty impressive. So I, I don't know, this is not me, torch me. I just sort of wanted to say, uh, I don't know, are, are you all right? And she actually glances down and thinks, and she actually rubs the scar on the side of her muzzle that is lighter than the rest of her fur from the training accident. I'm an open book, aren't I? All of he, says, he says, well, uh, I mean, I definitely uh, have some particular skills in, in reading folks. It's one of the reasons Torch sent me out here. Uh, but um, I mean, <laughs> I know you can see really well in here, even in the dark, but uh, the, the drawn curtains were a, a bit of a giveaway in my experience. I can see why they sent you. And uh, she she hops up because the kettle starts to whistle. Mm -hmm. And she she takes a little time to, to make her tea and then she sits down and you know, I just met you, but the fact that you even asked means a lot says uh, look like i said i uh i don't mean to overstep this is no no no, <laughs> I would no no it's it's you're not overstepping i don't and you know she's trying really hard not to cry because just that bit of kindness is something she hasn't had in a long time and he, go ahead yeah no no go ahead and she kind of stares down in her mug for a while and it's just nice for someone to actually care, you know? Uh, he sort of shrugs uh, and he uh, he sort of, he took one of his braids and, and sort of, uh, you know, started playing with a little bit as he got a little more comfortable and he tosses that back behind his shoulder and he says, I, I mean, look, I, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't really know you, but uh, I mean, Everything we've just talked about is is pretty impressive. Torch thinks, you know, we should reach out to you for this particular mission. And I, I don't know, I, uh, 
I've met a lot of people sort of doing this recruitment for Torch. And uh, it takes all types, you know, to run that organization and make it work. Uh, but um, I, I can't really say a whole lot about the mission itself, but uh, I think the type of folks that they're looking for for it, um, I don't know. Uh, if you're going to go along with this mission, I think you're probably worth having a conversation with and worth checking in on. Uh, and uh, well, he sort of looks down and says, um, I, I happen to, to know a little bit about uh, what it's like to have bad days. I, I don't know what, you know, what your bad day is about, but uh, I can tell you from my, from my point of view, you know, my, uh, my abilities at reading people are really just top notch in terms of the job description, but it can be exhausting, you know, sort of always being aware of, of the people and, and their, their emotions around me. And, uh, and sometimes that weighs on me and, and makes me wonder, I don't know, you know, if it's worth it to be out and about when I got to feel all of that. So um, look, like I said, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of going on and on here, but my, my point is, I don't know what's going on, uh, but if me asking can help even a little bit, uh, I'll feel good about that, uh, sort of figuratively and, uh, well, literally, because uh, if I can make you feel better, <laughs> I'll feel better. And, uh, you know, if, if, if it wouldn't probably terrify this young man, <laughs> She would actually smile, but a hyena smiling is kind of Whoa. terrifying. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> did you? I don't think I even got your name. What is it? Uh, he says, "Oh, uh, of course. Sorry, I'm so used to you know doing the the in interview and and back out thing." Uh, and he uh, he thinks for uh, a minute and he says, "Well." Uh, Within Torch, you know, we don't, uh, especially those of, of my position, we don't often uh, share share our names. Uh, but but I'm happy to with you. Uh, and and he uh, he sort of smiles and nods at you and says, uh, "Invicta, it's a it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is uh, Dami." I'm very happy to meet you. And you know, you asked in. I might as well tell you, so maybe it'll help me feel better too. Well, good. It's, good. it's kind of funny you showed up. I was actually thinking I should pack it up and quit, go somewhere else. Because yesterday was a day of all failure. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I've been there. Uh, I actually did pack up and leave. Uh, it's how I ended up at torch wasn't what I what I was always doing. Um, turned out for the best for me, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder what things would have been like if I'd stayed where I was and you know sort of gritted my teeth and stuck through it. Um, could you do me a favor? Sure. <laughs> could you at least stick with it long enough to finish the mission I just hired you for? Yeah, and if it gets me off the planet for a while, it'll be a nice little break. Ah, there you go. Win-win. See, we're making progress already. I like you. <laughs> well, thanks. I uh, I don't think I've ever said this about anyone that I've interviewed for Torch, but uh, I like you too. Hmm. Well, hey, uh, yeah. sorry. No, I, I just want to say... Um, Maybe stick with it longer than just the mission, yeah? Uh, no one is ever really gonna know like what it's like to be you, you know what I mean? Uh, there aren't a ton of Solansi working for Torch uh, and so that sort of feels weird sometimes at work. Uh, and I bet, I don't, I don't mean to make any assumptions, but I bet there's not a whole, whole lot of Hyannols that are quite as combat experienced as you. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it just means we got to work a little harder to prove that we can do it. Uh, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, I think you can. So if somebody ever tells you otherwise, you have them come talk to me. Well, you know what it's like being one of the only ones you got to work three times as hard to get apps to notice. 
been there, done that. But at least, at least in my experience, eventually most people sort of are willing to, uh, to be proved wrong eventually. It takes a lot more work for, for folks like us sometimes. Uh, yeah, it does. Well, but hey, we can get there. We can get there, and depending on what happens with this mission, if you stick around, you're always welcome here for some sunlight and some water. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And uh, I don't know, when you get back from the mission, look me up. Let me know how it went. And let me know if there's anybody that I gotta have a talking to for telling you that uh, you couldn't do it. Oh, if you could only talk to half my team. But that can keep for later. I'll look forward to it. As will I. And the memory fades uh, and Invicta sort of without realizing you've traversed the corridor all the way there, you find yourself in uh, the engine room with Bertrand and we're back on the ship and dealing with some problems. So let's go back to that. All right. <laughs> all right. So we are back and we have a couple of water tanks that are threatening to both spill all that precious water out and also explode. Uh, so uh, we have been with uh, Invicta uh, for just a moment. So I just want to go over uh, back to the cargo bay uh, quickly just to see how things are going in here. Who's taking what? Now I know uh, Sila was going, Sila 919 was going to use uh, a braid to deal with at least one of the leaks. Is that still the plan, Silent 919? Captain Silent 919. And the intention was to be able to not only facilitate the leak that is in this room, but to facilitate the leak that is in the next room by using the extensions that are at her disposal. Aha, okay. Uh, so do you, are you, let's see. So I think you've got two that can do this sort of fine repair work. Uh, so you want one to be on one of the tanks in the cargo room and then send the other to help deal with the uh, the crack in the engine room, is that correct? Or do you want to send them both to the engine room? I would like to split them. That would be the preferable treatment. Excellent. All right. So Sil Captain Sila 919 uh, has got has got hair go in two directions and dealing with that. Uh, I lie in Akemba. Now, Akemba, you, uh, Bertrand, originally handed you uh, the controls for the repair drones. Looks like at this point, you're really only going to need one of them because it looks like hopefully Sila has the other one taken care of. Uh, what are you, what's your plan here? And then we'll see what I, how I is going to uh, participate or, or, or not. I don't know. <laughs> Emma was just kind of like watching the repair situation happen and wanting to like head toward whichever one wasn't taken care of and then kind of looking at Bertrand like, whenever you're ready, let me know when I can correct this last tank. All right, so you're there with the controls for that yes. repair drone. Uh, Eli, how about you? Uh, there, yeah. is, there is still one other repair drone because uh, originally Bertram was in intending on using one for each of the cracks. So, mm -hmm. um, I lie is going to try and give the repair drone a go. They're not the best at technology. Um, <laughs> but the I lie is also going to say over the uh, intercom like a call out to Bertrand. Uh -huh. um, I know that um, some ships have uh, valves that you can close sometimes to lessen the pressure or shut some valves to give us some more time. Is there something that I can do with that? I, I don't mind um, manipulating a drone, but I feel like I'm best suited to uh, possibly run around and maybe redirect some flows if that's going to help us. Uh, Bertrand comes back uh, and says, oh yes, uh, that's actually a very clever idea. Uh, why don't you do this? Uh, and he sort of walks you through some uh, some manual release uh, on these two tanks. Uh, and basically what he asks you to do is keep an eye on the pressure, uh, the pressure readouts for both tanks. Uh, and he sort of gives you like, he tells you what the, the pressure threshold for these constructions is and says, you know, if you get within a certain range of that, 
that open up these manual valves. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna mean that some more that the water is going to flow out more quickly, but it will ensure that uh, he and Invicta and uh, Captain Silent Nine One Nine's braid. Uh, you know, if anything goes wrong with the timing, they'll have a little bit of buffer space if you're able to help release some of the pressure by letting more water out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, sure, what will be done. Uh, thank you, Bertrand, for uh, giving me a suggestion how I can support the team. And uh, Ila is going to make their way over to where those uh, pressure valves are. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and they're in good view of both of the pressure readouts on the tanks. Uh, and so you all are prepared. Uh, we go over to the engine room where Invicta has just arrived uh, and Bertrand, uh, that conversation just finished. Uh, Invicta has arrived and shortly behind her is Captain Silent 919's braid uh, sort of snaking into the room. Um, and Bertrand sees you come in uh, and the braid come in uh, and says, ah, oh, uh, excellent. Uh, I think I have, uh, there are, uh, I've narrowed down the possible locations uh, of the breach that is causing the uh, sort of uh, topsy-turvy exhaust flow. Uh, I think our best bet is to, uh, and he sort of looks down at the braid. Ooh, uh, well, uh, to each, all <clears throat> three of us, uh, to go to these different locations and begin attempting uh, to look for and patch any cracks. Uh, does that sound all right, Invicta? Yes. Uh, he then turns and pauses, looking at the braid, and says, um, does, does that, do you think I talk to the, does that sound? I Oh, uh, no, and I, that creeps me out. I'm going, just point me to where I need to patch something. Uh, and he nods and he sort of cocks his head a little bit and says, um, you're all right. Yes, Invicta. No, but let's fix yeah. this first. Oh, all right. Uh, so he points you down to sort of the furthest possible uh, sector where there might be one of the cracks uh, and, and sends you on down that way. And then he sort of looks down at the braid and sort of unsure where there might be like microphones or audio sensors, just sort of a little extra loudly says, uh, is that amenable to you, Captain Sila 919? There's no need to speak so loudly. I can hear you at all times. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, Captain. My apologies. Uh, if you would, uh, I believe another possible location is, and he points the braid towards uh, the second sector, uh, sort of uh, closest to this side of the engine room, uh, where you can go. He then uh, sort of calls over to those of you in the cargo bay, uh, uh, Ikemba and Ailai, are you two both prepared to begin the process of repair? Quite prepared. I am prepared when you are. Excellent. Uh, we can begin uh, repairing one of the tank's water cracks. The two on that wall are linked together. So once that repair is done, I will have a much better idea of the crack here and we will have to work quickly. Indeed. Yes. So, which one of you, uh, Invicta or uh, Silent919's uh, braid in the cargo room, which one of you is going to do the first uh, repair to the first tank? Oh, let the braid go first. Oh, sorry. I said Invicta. I meant Akemba. I'm sorry. I knew I was going to do that. I can't believe it's <laughs> taken me four episodes to both make that mistake and not realize that I made it. Uh, <laughs> So Ikemba or Sila 919 sprayed in the cargo hold, which one of you is going to uh, repair the first crack? I'm going to leave it to the captain. All right. Captain Sila 919, uh, you're going to get in there and repair this, uh, this crack. So let's start putting together a dice pool for you to delicately go in, uh, repair the crack swiftly, and make sure that it's completely sealed. Uh, and so you can tell me a little bit about how you're going to put that together while I find my narrator page. Here we go. I believe that the most logical thing to start with would be 
do it right or get out of my way. <laughs> I absolutely think that uh, holds water, in, uh, no pun intended, in this particular situation. You all good? Uh-oh, I am seeing consternation and I don't think it's Silas. <laughs> oh dear. Uh-oh. Uh, just having some issues with my character sheet being oh. a, what is commonly referred to in the Montagane way as a little bitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dave, do you hear that? That's canon now, write that down. <laughs> Dave back in chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome back, B. Dave Walters. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's giving you trouble, I can also do it from my end for this one, and then we can sort it out if that's helpful. You hear my angry train sounds. That's also <laughs> canon. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with my do it right or get out of my way yep love that followed by weaponized braid uh yeah do it right or get out of my way weaponized braid great um any let's see what were the skills that you stepped up last week i have them written down here uh we got for you we got notice and fly um, um I would or, go with notice, but I think that it would be better for me if I went with power because one of Sila 919, Captain oh. Sila 919's ultimate traits is the fact that her hair is a part of her power because it represents such a large part of herself. Okay. All right. I get that. Let's toss that in. Now, uh, notice and fly were the only skills you stepped up last week, but you've got several points left. Are there any other, let me see, are there any other, I don't know, is, is Sila 919 maybe uh, a, somewhat trained in fix? Or maybe I'm trying to think of some of the other skills on the list that might apply here, or, or maybe not. Maybe this is the dice pool and, and that's that. That's also fine. What do you think? Um, actually, fix would work perfectly as okay. that is one of the main tenets of her weaponized braids. Okay, great, great. Uh, and what, uh, how stepped up do you think your fix skill is? D6, D8, D10? Well, me, Christina says, oh, who knows? <laughs> Sila sure. would say that it is a D10 because she is fantastic and there is nothing that she fails at. So right. I would go with a D8 just to find a happy medium. <laughs> okay, I love that. I love that. And, you know, if we discover in later episodes that actually it is a D10 and you've got the points left, then we can step it up later. Great. All right, so we're going to toss another D8 in this pool uh, for whatever we just said, uh, fix, great. <laughs> All right, seem like a good pool for you. Uh, I am gonna go ahead and toss my pool together. Now, Sila, as I recall, you had two stresses. I think it was a D6 in Insecure and a D6 in something else. Do you remember what it was? Unfortunately, it didn't save to the sheet. Was it exhausted? It was exhausted and it was stress. Insecure and stress. Insecure. All right. Um, I think, you know what I'm actually going to say? I think that flashback scene and remembering what your mentor said to you, I think we're going to count that as a rest scene. It's not exactly how it's meant to work, but I think that bolstered you a little bit. And I'm going to step that uh, I'm going to step that insecure stress down to a D4. Now, here's a little mechanics lesson for everybody. Stress works a little bit differently when it's at a D4. When it's at a D4, you actually, the player actually adds it to their dice pool. Why is that? Well, because a D4, you have a 25% chance of rolling a hitch on a D4. So generally, if you've got a D4 in your dice pool, it's actually more of a liability than it is a help in many cases. So the way stresses work is once you bring them down to a D4, the next time you do a dice pool that might in some way uh, you uh, integrate that stress, you, the player, add it to your dice pool. And then after that pool is done, that stress is removed completely. You no longer have any stress in that category. 
So I'm going to add a D4 to your pool for that. And then you can remove that stress in time. Well, you don't have to remove it because it didn't, it's not currently in your character sheet, but you would normally be able to remove that stress entirely from your sheet after this. All right. So I've got two D8s. This is a delicate procedure that we've got going on here. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. This is the first tank. This is 2D6 uh, on this one. So I'm going to roll to set the difficulty. And I rolled a two and a four. So your difficulty is six. Nothing too stressful there. Are you all set to roll or to have uh, the pool that I have built roll? <laughs> Please roll. All right, here we go. This is a lot of pressure and I don't like it. I feel like, okay, very nicely done. No hitches. Uh, and let's see, we, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to futz with this a little bit to give you as large an effect die as possible. So right now uh, you have more than enough to hit that difficulty, uh, that relatively low difficulty of six. So I'm just gonna reorganize this a little bit to put a D10 as your effect die. So uh, I don't, if you could see what I just did, I moved some dice around. Your total is now 11, which is well and truly above the difficulty number. Your effect die is a D10. So if you remember from when uh, Ikemba made his test uh, and we took a look at that effect die, you are going to quickly, efficiently, and probably most importantly, completely seal off the crack for one of these, uh, for one of these tanks. Now, the rest of you immediately notice a change. Uh, Ikemba and Eli, you're both in the room. Uh, oh, and Silent 919, Captain Silent 919. You're in the cargo room. So you immediately notice that the other tank, the crack in the other tank, starts pushing out water at an accelerated rate. To be expected. Eli, yep, Eli, you see the pressure in the tank that was just sealed shoot up a little bit and then sort of level out somewhat. So it goes up, which is, uh, well, I don't, maybe not for eye life. For me, it's very stressful. Uh, shoots up sort of very quickly and then continues to rise, but at a much more manageable pace. But it did jump that bit as soon as Sila finished sealing this. So uh, is there anything that any of you all are doing in that chamber before we head over to the engine room? Uh, just Eli's gonna, I don't know if you already said that that was the desired effect, but Eli, um, they're going to, um, essentially try and use the lever to kind of maybe, uh, what is the word for it? Anyway, they're trying to like let loose, like maybe little tiny streams, not streams, but like some pressure to, um, relieve the pressure a bit. So they're going to, uh, do that, uh, to see if that's going to help with the pressure gauge. Yeah. Uh, and it does, and it's sort of a delicate balance for you uh, because, you know, obviously the more you let out, the more water you lose, but the, the better the pressure is gonna look at least for the time being. Uh, and so you are able to, uh, to level out that, that pressure increase to an even slower sort of rise. Uh, and it's, it's up to you and feel free to, you know, at any point uh, interrupt me to let me know if you're gonna adjust that valve because right now there is a fair bit of water between the remaining crack and now the open valve. There's a fair bit of water flowing uh, out of the tanks but it, it seems to have stabilized things in a way that is relatively comfortable for at least the moment. Make sense? Yeah, uh, Eli's gonna say over the uh, ship comms, I'm relieving a bit of pressure. Um, let's make sure that we're doing the, the right things at the right times. Uh, and that's all they're gonna say. All right, uh, Ikemba, anything, or si uh, Captain Silent Number 9, anything else before we head to the engine room? In response to that, Ikemba kind of uh, pings and says, uh, Bertrand, wheel the pressure help things uh, and also uh, are we lo losing too much water for the mission i am prepared to fix this tank when you're ready so as that communique goes we we hop over to the engine room and see a uh an excited frantic uh and hopping into action bertrand uh there is uh 
there is a lot of activity. There are uh, there are some alarms going off now in the engine room, which Bertrand did warn uh, the two of you in there that this will probably happen. And then as long as we deal with it quickly, it's okay. There are lights flashing. And there are actually uh, not one, but two different points uh, that are now uh, emitting steam, releasing steam and exhaust back into the engine room. Uh, and this is exactly what Bertrand hoped would happen. Uh, that masterful sealing of the first crack uh, sort of changed the pressure in a way that some of the exhaust is being forced back into the engine room. So you're able to identify exactly where uh, the, the cracks are. Let me find out where the cracks are now by rolling a couple of dice here in my real life with my actual physical dice um, to find out which position the cracks are in. Uh, whether they are in Bertrand's position, Invicta's position, or Captain Silent 919's position. So the first crack that appears, appears in Invicta's position. And the second crack that appears, appears in Oh, Bertrand's position. Uh, so Silent 919, uh, Captain Silent 919, <laughs> your braid uh, that is there and waiting and keeping track of everything doesn't notice, at least at this point, any, uh, any cracks to seal in front of it. But Bertrand and Invicta, both of you sort of get a face full of, of, of uh, exhaust uh, and can see very clearly where you need to patch. So Bertrand over the intercom to reply to Ikemba says, oh, excellent work. We go to work now, uh, stand ready to patch the second. Standing ready. Uh, so Invicta and Bertrand are going to need to uh, patch up some holes in here. Invicta, you wanna start telling oh us about how you're gonna do that? Uh, yes, I am going to, again, use hot, high and null. Um, I want to use intense, but it's not, it's only letting me pick one of my distinctions. Ah, uh, um, yes. So I, uh, and I, <laughs> I need to double check on this, but I believe I actually, uh, may have been, uh, it may have been wrong. Let's just say the word that it is. I think I was wrong uh, earlier when I said that you can pick any or all of your distinctions. Distinctions okay. count as one of the categories, like skills, values, distinctions, and you can only ever gotcha. have one die from each category in a pool. Gotcha. All right, then I'm once again going to take fix, but I'm going to step it up. Okay, yep, you've got that D8. Eight. There we go. Um... And in this case, I'm going to keep knowledge, but I'm going to step it up to a 12. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Whoa. now, uh, great. All right. Let me think about something real quick. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to do some work here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what Invicta is doing and how these three things uh, uh, fit in and exactly how she's sort of patching this thing while I do some work here. Um, she's she's taking whatever it is that Barchin's handed her, whether it's a kid or of some kind, and after that like kind of face full of exhaust, she is very focused on, on the crack and, and making sure it doesn't get any wider. And, you know, even though it's it's the future, She's basically got like duct tape. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like a better, better word to do it. She's got some, she's got duct tape, but she is like doing it in a way where it's like almost latticed over the crack. Ah, I like that. So, like that. you know, one strip, then another strip so that not only should this seal it, but it'll keep it even if it does expand a little bit mm -hmm. until we can get everything kind of back on even keel. Yeah. Uh, and of course, being science fiction uh, duct tape, this duct tape has the ability to actually like molecularly bind with metal underneath it once it's been placed. Uh, and so once you know, once you've got the 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 strips where you want them and everything latticed, which is a brilliant plan, uh, you can sort of uh, you just run like it just takes a little bit of like friction heat and it binds to the metal itself. I love that. Uh, great. Okay. This is where is my screen here we go all right so uh i'm gonna put together this pool uh it is a little tougher in here so actually i'm going to do um, this 
If it's a little tougher, is it possible for me to step up fix one more before I roll? Yeah, if you want to spend, uh, if you want to spend another another point to step up your fix. Now remember when, and this is totally fine. I just want to make sure that we all uh, and and everyone watching too understands that when we're stepping up these things now, these are going to be permanent step ups on their character sheets because again, oh. they're spending uh, they're spending points left over from character creation. So your your fix will always be at whatever level we want to step it to. The value of knowledge mm. that actually. Uh, that isn't able to be stepped up permanently. Uh, that, because okay. the values, you know, that we have to have that array of values, 1d10, 2d8, 2d6, 1d4. Right, uh, but so the skills, if we're gonna, gonna spend them, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna permanently bump this to eight because it feels like we're gonna be doing a lot of fixing during this, during these tales. <laughs> Uh, not wrong. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So it, it uh, you know, uh, maybe after, uh, after you met with the torch representative, uh, you know, he did sort of ask you about your, your mechanic abilities. So maybe you, you know, studied up a little bit before you headed to torch HQ. And so now it's all the way up there to a D10. I love it. All right. So I have two D8s in my pool. We're going to roll that because I don't think You've got an exhausted stress, and I don't think that's actually going to play into this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I also, for you, uh, will do the same thing that I did for uh, Captain Silent 919. Let's step that exhausted stress down from your memory scene. Let's step it down to a D4, which means you'll okay. pop it into your dice pool this time around. Uh, just add it in. Just add a, yeah, just manually drag a, a D4 into that little box below where your dice are currently sitting. There we go. There you go. All right. Uh, ah. And so once this roll is done, you'll be able to clear that exhausted stress from your sheet. But I'm going to roll okay. now to see, set the difficulty. What do we got? Man, I really used just all of my good numbers last week. That is a seven. Uh, seven total for you to beat. Uh, so go ahead and roll up your pool and let's see what happens. All righty. Uh, a 10, a four, a four, and a three. All right, no hitches, more than enough uh, to, uh, was that D10 on a 10, on a D12, sorry, was that 10 on a D10 or a D12? Oh, there we go, it finally popped up. On a up. D10. Yeah, all right, so if I may, uh, yeah. So you can absolutely surpass, you can put those two fours in your total and move that D12 over to your effect die uh, so that you have a even more impressive success with a D12 effect die. That is, I mean, you, like you spent every day practicing this lattice formation with our sci-fi duct tape, you put that there uh, and slap it on, rub it so that it bonds, and immediately that thing is sealed. Now, what I'm gonna say with that brilliant D12 effect die uh, is I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to give Bertrand uh, an asset for his dice pool that he puts together to do this uh, because you were so quick uh, that you were able to, I don't know if you go over to help him or you let him know that you were successful. I don't, I'm, what is it that you do to assist Bertrand since yours went so well? Um, once I'm, I'm confident that this is gonna stay, uh -huh. it's adhered, I dash over and and help Bartran. I just basically like, I have tape. I got tape. <laughs> yes, the tape is the asset. Of course it is. Of course it is. He was going to sit there and like weld it shut and take forever. And you're just like, nah, do this. I love it. All right. So let me, uh, let me do this very quickly. I'm going to roll up the difficulty for Bertrand. It's a little higher. That's a nine, but he's got your help. So he should probably be just fine. Now all I need to do is find his stats, which of course are on a piece of paper. Ah, here we go. All right, so he's got to beat a nine. He is going to, he's got a D10 in fix because he is in fact an engineer. Uh, he has a D8 from his Hothere distinction because they are quite the capable and clever mechanics and engineers. Uh, he's, you know what? We're gonna toss in another D8 for his knowledge because uh, he knows about all of this good, good stuff. And then a D6 from your um, from your tape asset that you were providing to him. So we're gonna roll that up for him. And 
no hitches and well surpassed what we needed here. We can even give him a D10 effect die as well. So the two of you in tandem are just patching these holes. It's a beautiful thing uh, and all is well there. And immediately after that, uh, Bertrand is on comms alerting uh, the, the cargo room and Ikemba specifically, uh, patch the final tank. Um, so we shift back to the cargo room, I lie. Uh, the pressure is, is, booming. is rising. Yeah, it's <laughs> booming. Uh, um, and, and so is the water flow. So you've got a decision to make here. Um, how much does, okay. So I imagine I see just a pressure uh, gauge, which doesn't tell me volume. It's different from volume. So is there also a volume gauge next to these pressure gauges? Because yeah. Um, Akimba made a great point that we don't want to lose all this water we're supposed to get to the people, but we also don't want to explode. So like there's yeah. a fine line of exploding and getting water. So yeah, I like having to bounce that out. Is there any sort of indicators? Uh, yes, there are, there are volume indicators on both tanks. Uh, and the volume of the one in particular, obviously in this tank is going down pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, you know, the, the tank that's been patched uh, was able to be patched at about half capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means essentially not counting this last one, you have two and a half tanks worth of water. And these are, I mean, these are big. You remember right. this ship yeah. is enormous. Yeah. These are, shall we say, Hathoray sized tanks. They're supposed so to supply is... a lot of water, so. Right, exactly. There's a lot of water. Two and a half is definitely not enough, right? Two and a half tanks is is really not going to actually, unless you all can get to the planet and sort of immediately diagnose the problem with the irrigation system and fix it, two and a half tanks is not going to be enough. Uh, three tanks is really cutting it close, and there's a little more than half a tank left in the one that's still Ruptured. So how much do we have in total, like actual have water on the ship? Like how much water do we have in total? Uh, do, are you asking me to give this to you in a actual volume match volume? Uh, no, no, no. You just give me okay. just ball ballpark the number of tanks we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've got two and a half tanks for sure. Uh, okay. If you include the fourth tank, you've got a little over three tanks. Gotcha. Uh, but it's going down fairly quickly. So, you know, it's up to you. Do you want to end up at Hawthorne with a little less water than you would like and hope that you can fix the problem quickly? Uh, or do you want to slow down that flow, make sure that you have enough, that you arrive with enough water, but make Ikemba's job a little tougher because he's going to have to move fast? Um, I'm going to announce over the uh, intercoms. Um, Akimba, uh you're going to have to be uh, very on the spot with your next uh, repair. And uh, I'm going to shut off the valve so we can make sure that there's enough water by the time we get there. And uh, I'm going to crank on it. And I'm pretty sure everyone in the ship is going to hear like <laughs> kind of like that water and metal, like creaky noise. Yeah. Uh, just to add to some pressure and, and some of the scene there. Um, but I am ready to like, put the lever back down to open it up just in case. And I'm like already like leveraging my leg against some other bit so that I can put full body weight just in case like things nice. get real bad. Nice. Uh, you notice that the pressure does begin to climb again yeah. uh, at a faster pace, but it's it's manageable. And if it can be gets right in there, uh, then, then, you know, you should be okay. So it can be. The time has come. It is time. It is time. Uh, all right, let's put together a dice pool for you to pilot this uh, repair drone into Ooh. there uh, and seal it or or something else. I don't know. You tell me what you're doing. I shouldn't. Uh, I shouldn't. It's... <laughs> Would using the drone assist in this with die rolls at all? I think the drone is going to act essentially as a D6 asset. I don't think it's going to be mm. any more than that just because uh, it's a new device to you. Uh, and so, you know, Bertrand uh, showed you the controls, but it is the first time you've really actually used it. Uh, gotcha. So I think we're going to stick to a D6 asset that if you would like, you can add to your dice pool. Cool. Uh, done. Like the second Great. you said D6, it was done. There's no question. I, I need every <laughs> extra roll I can get my hands on. Uh, I'm going to bump my fix up fully to D12 because uh, it's at a D8 right now. Okay. I'm cool with burning those extra two points. 
and uh, pushing that to a D12. Let's so go. Okay. Add the D12 to it because fix. Um, and also knowledge because mm-hmm. he understands everything that's happening. And sure. he understands, he has a pretty good understanding of the ship's systems after uh, getting the details from Bertrand and from Eli and like everything that's gone on thus far. He can connect all that. So he's good. Uh, but also, he's going to bump that fix up because you got to fix whatever <laughs> you can. And right. um, so we have learned that Akemba is very, very good at fixing things. Yes. Uh, I feel like it, it's logical for a bio priest to be good at fixing things. And also, especially with a with a distinction of life, it's logical. It makes perfect sense. And also, sure, since he's had that sure. history in space again, bombing that Musalian uh, distinction in there as well. So I am ready sure. to roll if that works. All right. That uh, works for me. Let me go ahead and put this in here. Uh, let's see. You still just have that injured stress. And again, I don't think that actually does come into play in this situation. So I'm not going to be using that against you. I am going to add, uh, so I've got my two D8 dice pool. I am going to add a D6 to it uh, because uh, in conserving more water, Eli has made things a little tougher on you, uh, mm-hmm. which is, you know, which was the choice that was made. And, and I, I it's a smart move the right way for me but anyway uh it does make things a little tougher on you so i'm going to toss in an additional d6 to this dice pool and roll up this difficulty let's see what we get okay uh so this is a 12 difficulty totally doable with your dice pool i have all the confidence in the world so akemba goes pilots the drone in and let's see how it goes All right, absolutely. And again, in fact, if we really want to play with effect die even more, effect dice even more, uh, you could move that six that's currently in effect over to total and that eight over to effect because that would give you a D12 effect die. And that's amazing. So six Uh, to the total and eight to effect? uh, Yes. So so (coughs) again, just to sort of- Six six to uh, the total and eight to the effect. I had it backwards, my bad. That's all right. There we go. Oh, wait. Are you talking about the actual eight? Uh, sorry, the eight number, not the D8. Yeah, sorry. Right, kill, kill. <laughs> you you had the go. right instinct, I have to say, because really, effect die, I should only be talking about dice sizes. Yes, um, so, yes. So, apps, this, you just, you sync with the machine. You know what I mean? Like, you're in the zone uh, with this, with these controls. You hop in there. The water is blasting out. The drone sort of takes a direct hit from a particularly strong blast of water and sort of you know, gets knocked to the side, but you course correct immediately, pilot in there. And it's almost as if you can feel the effort that this drone is putting in the force that it is using uh, to get its tools up against the crack that is now just bursting with water. Uh, And as it does, it is able to, you see sort of that arc light, that arc uh, as it begins to weld and it sort of almost looks like it's sewing up the tear with its little welding arm uh, and up it goes. And after just a few moments, uh, there is sort of a a tense bit of silence. Uh, There is no more water flowing and Bertrand uh, from the engine room trumpets over the comms and says, we've done it. Uh, Yes, systems returning to normal. Uh, I lie, how do we fare with water volume? Um, it seems that uh, we have just the minimal amount of water needed to succeed, perhaps, in our mission, with a uh, little more than three tanks still left. Ah, all things considered, this is wonderful news. Ah, congratulations, everyone. Well, okay. Uh, go team. Yes, yes, go team. Great work, Such everyone. A- demonstrative bunch <laughs> well done fantastic work all Vic is actually silent as she puts her tools away uh Bertrand sort of notices that and uh turns to you and just calms off so uh you know he's not broadcasting this uh but he turns to you Invicta and he says just totally you know without well <laughs> as much without subtext as Bertrand can manage uh he turns to you and just says well done, Invicta. Thank you, Bertrand. Of course. Now, I think we've all earned that dinner I promised, don't you? 
Hmm. Yes, I probably will spend some time in my room before dinner is served. Well, I will be sure to alert you when it is prepared. Um, yes, please let me know when um, dinner is ready. I, I'm going to take a little time here and i um, going to sweep or, or, or uh, take care of a little bit of water in this, um, this water room and engine room. Just, just finishing up, just tidying up. Um, don't worry about it. It's calming in a way. And I'm just going to like, I don't know if like I'm, I'm getting too much into it. If there's like some like places That's where I can great. sweep the water so it gets sucked up or like some sort of like vacuum thing that they like some wet vac. I don't like know. Like a bilge pump sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's what Isla is doing. They are very yeah. happy just like finding their Zen and, and, and taking care of things. I love that. Absolutely. And Bertrand, you know, thanks you. He, he was so, you know, that adrenaline high and now he's getting ready to make y'all dinner, which he's very excited about. So that completely slipped his mind and he's very grateful. Oh, <laughs> good. I was just very concerned for a second. I was like, wow. Yep, so was I. <laughs> uh, excellent. So you all can sort of uh, take take a few moments to return to your cabins if you want, or in this case, Eli is helping to clean up here, do what you want. Bertrand heads to the galley to begin preparing uh, not just a Hathare dinner, but there will also be, you know, uh, animal proteins and then all sorts of things uh, for you all. And uh, and hopefully, you know, the next day or or two or however long is left in your journey to Hathare uh, will be quiet. And uh, as much as it pains me, I, I don't think we're gonna end on too much of a cliffhanger this week, which <laughs> I'm just gonna have to accept in my soul. But- um, Oh, wait. Uh, oh, 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 Sila. Oh, yes, please. No, huh, I'm muted. Pardon me, Invicta, may I have a moment of your time? No. Well, I can understand your apprehension. Invicta cuts the comms. <gasps> She's not I would like to go that. over the entire comms and say, Invicta, you are a benefit and an asset to your team and environment. Thank you. End comm. Victor doesn't care at all. Oh, I love this. So not, uh, not definitely not a, uh, not necessarily a cliffhanger, but a, a wonderful for me as the storyteller emotional moment uh, where we see Sila uh, having a moment and expressing gratitude to another team member and, and being rebuffed in a way that I cannot imagine she expected. Invicta deep in her feelings, rightfully so, after we saw uh, a bit of that scene before she was hired. Eli is cleaning up uh, in the cargo room. What's Akimba doing real quick? Oh, go ahead, Eli. Oh, while I'm just like sweeping or taking care of water while that intercom transmission was going on, um, I'm going to say, well, it's going to make for a quite entertaining mission. And I'm just like smiling to myself, like in this room that's like dripping and stuff, but just like making a witty comment to themselves uh, as, as they're just sweeping the water in, in that time. I love it. Uh, Ikemba, real quick, what are you up to in this, in this immediate moment after the danger has passed? I was just kind of looking around just like, wow. And, uh, Kind of heading toward Eli, wanting to help with getting oh. and or saving as much water as possible, considering that's our mission, and kind of asking like where he can be of use. Cool. So the two of you working together, uh, the other two having their moment separately, uh, and that is where we'll uh, where we'll end this week's session. Hey, this was really great. Thank you all so much. I had a blast. I hope you all did as well. Uh, this was very cool. Getting to see a little bit about uh, Silent 919 and Invicta's backstory, sort of just dipping into that and then lots of excitement on the ship. So thank you all so, so much. Uh, right, let's let's go around and, uh, and do uh, some outros. Uh, let everybody know who you are, where they can find you on the interwebs, anything else they should be looking out for from you all. Uh, and let's start, if we could, this evening with Christina. Hi, my name is Christina Ariel. Am I muted? No, I'm not. Christina Ariel, K-R-Y-S-T-I-N-A-A-R-I-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram under that name. You can find me on Mondays on Improvised Champions on twitch.tv slash CNE Games, where I work with Mark Mir and we narrate the playover of Idle Champions. You can also find me at three o'clock also on Monday with Michael Kritz. 
as we do our fun game on twitch.tv slash LFM underscore network in our fun of journey to the obsidian spire you can also find me here obviously on sundays because that's when i like to hang out with the homies and on the 30th for the halloween special with some really really cool people on twitch.tv slash dnd but other than that hang out with me here where i get to play an emotionally vacuous person yay Hooray! I love it. Yes, follow all the things. Watch Christina do all the lovely things. I love it. Uh, let's continue on down the line over to DJ. Oh, hi. I'm DJ Knight. I am a space and sci-fi streamer. Uh, I am all of the excite because I just got done getting most of the parts for the new PC I'm building for Cyberpunk. And Watch Dogs Legion launches this week, which uh, Watch Dogs 2 is my game of the like tied for my game of the year in 2016 because POC lee like in a major game yes give me and he was cool as all get out so uh that kind of is the thing that i'm super excited for like watch dogs Legion is in my soul as a must uh until cyberpunk so i'm probably gonna be playing like nothing but that the second i get the chance because i feel that watch dogs Legion. if you haven't seen the initial commercials where they just said uh oh hire anybody and it's like it's you can literally hire anybody and it makes me excited uh, in and around my body. So this week is going to be basically that. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time hacking things because STEM, give me all the hacking ability. Give it to me. I love it. I'm going <laughs> to shut up. I'm good. I love it. See nah, you're here great. Next, next Sunday uh, with right. more of these amazing human beings. All right. So go check out, follow DJ, check out all of that amazing stuff. Continuing on down the line, Michael. Hey, it's Michael Sinclair II, also known as Michael Crates Everywhere on Twitter and on Twitch. Uh, on Twitch, I stream World of Warcraft, Magic the Gathering, and Baldur's Gate. I might actually even stream programming like when I'm trying to do schoolwork, just so I can hang out with some folks. Um, as well as I am on the podcast Fae Forge Academy, which is really wonderful. Um, we're, we're getting some good remarks and uh, high, high ratings for that, so that's awesome. I'm also on the show with Christina Ariel, just uh, like she said, and uh, I'm on this show, I think, and I might be on a panel or something. Uh, I, not like I'm on this show, I think. Sorry, my brain just skips sometimes. I think that I'm on the panel or something later on uh, coming up. Just check my Twitter. Uh, sorry, my brain just moves sometimes really fast. But uh, sorry, yeah. I was just concerned. It was going to be news to me if you weren't on this show. No, uh, my character's gone next week. I'm. I, they're going to die. <laughs> no! Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. I love it. Uh, and looping back around, Tanya. Hey, y'all. I am your clearly emotionally stunted blade keeper, Invicta. And you can normally find me here where I'm doing many fun things. Uh, I'm also the DM for Rivals of Waterdeep. We took this week off because everyone had conflicts. But if you're around, go support Scarathon because they're raising money for Able Gamers. Uh, Thursdays, you won't find me on Wandering DM because we're taking a break between seasons, but there will be a third season. Dragon Age and Dungeon Crossing is on break while Shannon is going to be in New Zealand. So this and Rivals are my only shows for a while. I get to sleep in on Saturday. It's beautiful. Uh, but follow me on the Twitter, Cypher Tier Everywhere. Be back here next Sunday. And uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out and chilling with us. Yeah. This is going to be real interesting come next weekend. Yeah, it's been a ride. Well, once again, my name is Eugenio. Uh, you can find me on the internet as DM Jazzy Hands. I, uh, in addition to being the storyteller here every week, uh, I am the dungeon master and producer of an actual play D and D podcast called The Last Refuge. Uh, we just kicked off season seven, so lots of content to binge if that's your thing. Uh, you can find us online at, at DND Last Refuge on Twitter. Uh, I do stream here on Twitch as well on my channel, Twitch.tv slash DM Jazzy Hands. Uh, Tuesday afternoons, I I play Dragon Age 2. We're going through that series of games, having a good time there. And then Thursday afternoons and Friday nights, I stream Baldur's Gate 3. And I do use the Twitch integration. So the chat has all of the control when it comes to deciding, uh, making decisions for uh, RP interactions and conversations in game and stuff like that. It's been a very good time. So come hang out with me and, uh, and play through through those games. Uh, what else do I have? Let's see, coming up, 
I do not any longer have the game on Thursdays. Uh, and Tuesday, every other Tuesday, I'm over on Mini Terrain Domain uh, playing a game of D&D with uh, the Crafting Muse and Goblin Katie and Dr. B. Uh, and that's a ton of fun. So we're off this coming Tuesday, but we'll be back on the following week. Uh, really quickly, I want to just say thanks once again to our various sponsors and supporters. Thank you so much to Die Hard Dice uh, for supporting us and creating a custom set, the Musalian Skies Debt set that will hopefully be available soon. Blue Microphone for providing us this excellent hardware to make sure that y'all can hear us well. Obviously, Cortex by Fandom, our system is primed by Cortex and we are so grateful for them for that. Uh, and of course, thank you to Twitch for being such a major supporter of Into the Motherlands. Thank you all as well so much. It is so thrilling to see all of you here in chat, enjoying this with us every week. You've been so supportive. We super appreciate it. I super appreciate it, especially your patience with me as we are still developing this system. I remind y'all every week, but it's a work in progress and you all have been brilliant aware of that and I, I super appreciate it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we are going to continue to spread the love. If you want to hang out uh, a little bit longer, we are going to go raid Data Dave. Data Dave is playing some Pokemon Sword and Shield uh, and I imagine will enjoy uh, a huge chunk of Motherlands fans in, in their chat. Uh, so hang out. We're going to go raid them and we will see you all back here next Sunday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific uh, here at uh, twitch.tv slash Cypher of Tear for episode five of Into the Motherlands. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, wear a mask, and as always, happy gaming, y'all.